Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talking Landscape Photography. It's um, a real privilege to be able to bring you our 50th episode. It's really quite hard to believe that we've gotten that far since um, the humble beginnings, I guess, we had back in uh, April last year through COVID. Uh, and um, we've just got the most exciting show. We've been um, thinking about um, doing a show uh, re related to Peter Dombrovskis for a long, long time. So uh, very, very excited. And I'll throw it over to Nick to uh, introduce uh, the show tonight. Thanks, Luke. Uh, yeah, we're very, very excited about this. Um, 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 most um, landscape photographers in Tasmania have been influenced by um, the work and, um, and ethos of Peter Dombrovskis, um, and he holds a very special place in, in our hearts. And uh, we, we like to discuss tonight his legacy, um, his images, um, and, and what the future holds, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, we have four very special guests tonight, which we're very excited to, to have with us. And all our guests um, will be able to contribute their um, thoughts on, on Peter's legacy, their own um, um, experiences with, with Peter, um, those that had it, and um, it, it, we're really excited. So the four guests we have, uh, we've had three three of the guests before. Uh, we have Grant Dixon, of course, who um, is one of our uh, most adventurous landscape photographers. Um, we had him on the show showing his, um, his book, Winter Light, and um, we're very pleased to have you here, um, Grant, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we also have, of course, um, Rob Blakers, who is um, probably Tasmania's uh, most active um, conservation uh, photographer. Um, he's only just come back uh, from uh, doing some work in the Tarkine uh, today, and we're very pleased to have you with us, Rob, so thank you. Okay. And uh, joining us from the same location at uh, Simon Olding's house, we have Simon Olding, um, who is a, a master printer and a, a brilliant photographer in his own right, uh, particularly with black and white photography. And um, Simon presented a show very early on for us on, on printing. Uh, Simon um, uh, remastered a lot of um, um, Peter's work, and he'll talk to us tonight about um, uh, that, partic that work in particular a bit later on. And with, um, with Simon, we're very pleased to have with us for the first time uh, Chris Bell and Chris is um, he is one of the most brilliant photographers that we have in the state uh, in terms of landscape photography. His uh, work is absolutely sublime. He's produced five books, uh, four of those um, on Tasmania and the um, the wilderness of Tasmania. And his latest book is uh, based on uh, the Tarkine. Uh, it's a masterclass, his, um, his book on the Tarkine in, in print quality, um, and the images uh, just speak for themselves. So we're very honoured to have you with us, Chris, and, um, and I envisage in the future we'll also uh, have you on your own show to uh, share some of your own work. And I, I'll probably just throw you under a bus there, but we'd, we'd love to have you uh, come on and, and show your own work um, uh, in the not-too-distant future. So thanks, gents, for all joining us tonight. Uh, each, each of them, and particularly Chris, um, have um, you know, uh, their own um, relations um, and to Peter personally um, or his work and his work. And so uh, we're going to hear some, um, some, some stories, some anecdotes, um, as well as uh, talking about Peter's legacy. Uh, before we... Um, get into our guests. So I'm going to just run through a very brief, um, I say very brief, but I'm not always very brief, uh, overview of, um, of, of Peter's life, a, a, short, a biography, I suppose, of, um, of him, um, just to set the scene and those that may not be so aware of, 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 um, of who Peter was, just so they know where we're coming from. And, uh, and I'll talk about some of the major events very briefly. Uh, in um, uh, prominent ones that um, uh, were in his life. Uh, so Peter was born in 1945, born in uh, Germany. Um, his um, parents um, were um, Latvian. Uh, he was born yeah, in a refugee camp. Um, his father uh, died um, either before or soon after 
Peter's um, birth, um, and Peter never got to meet his father. Um, his mother, Adele, um, cared for Peter in the refugee camp, and in 1950, they moved to Sydney. Um, and from there, 1951, they moved to Tasmania, uh, basically to be as far away from war-torn Europe as they could get. Uh, they lived um, in Ferntree for most of their um, most of their lives, and, and Peter certainly did. Uh, so uh, there were a few years in South Hobart, uh, not long after they moved to Tasmania, but most of it was in Ferntree. Ferntree, for those that don't know, is um, in the foothills of Kanani Mount, Welling uh, Mount Wellington, and it's certainly a place where Peter, um, through his um, mother's encouragement, um, developed his uh, love for the natural world and he spent um, um, many, many, many um, days and weeks and months on the mountain walking and trekking uh, and later uh, capturing images. Uh, Peter uh, trained as a, um, uh, a draftsman and uh, initially worked for um, the Tasmanian Department of Construction and um, uh, before moving into full-time photography at a later date. He started producing, um, um, well, I'll, I'll go back first a bit to his um, teenage years. Uh, when he was 17, uh, he met um, Alagus Trahanis, um, who was um, uh, turned out to be his uh, mentor um, and um, a, a great photographer and adventurer that is well known in Tasmanian history in his own right. Um, Peter um, learnt to canoe with um, and kayak with Alagus and as well as being shown how to ski and Alagus also took him under his wing as far as his development of photography um, uh, went through the years. Uh, Alagus um, sadly passed away in 1972 setting out to uh, photograph um, the Gordon River um, which was the second time he had been on such a journey. He uh, went in 1958 and was the first person to um, kayak the length of the Gordon, which was a, an amazing achievement back in the time. Uh, but sadly, his photographs um, were lost in a fire, uh, in the major fires in 1967 when his um, house was burnt down. And in 1972, um, with the looming uh, prospect of... Um, of uh, the damming of uh, rivers in Tasmania and certainly um, around the time that Lake Pedder was um, uh, about to be flooded, uh, Lagos set out to do his journey again. Unfortunately, as he set out, he um, slipped on a uh, rock and hit his head and uh, went under the water. And two days later, uh, Peter, it was Peter um, with the search party, but Peter himself who found his mentor's uh, body uh, in the river. Uh, very sad uh, moment for Peter and, and for Tasmania. So from that point, uh, I think Peter probably felt that um, he, he had the work of Alagas uh, in Alagas's conservation uh, photography uh, to, to continue. And uh, his photography developed at a, a fairly rapid rate from that point. He, his first calendar was produced in 1972 for the year 1973 and those calendars were produced all the way up until 2008 or 2009. Uh, Peter published his first book um, with the poet Ellen Miller uh, in 1977 called The Quiet Land. Uh, it featured mainly wilderness photographs but it also featured some um, photographs from um, uh, urban areas around Tasmania or, or rural areas as well. Uh, and then I think in 1976 or 1977, he produced his first uh, pure wilderness calendar. And from that moment on, all his calendars focused on, on wilderness uh, photographs and most of those based in Tasmania. In 1979 and 1980 and 1981, Peter took three solo trips down the Franklin River. The Franklin River was in danger of being dammed by the Hydroelectric Commission and Peter felt it was his duty to travel down the river and to capture images um, uh, to help in the conservation effort to save the Franklin River from being dammed. One of those images which he took in his first trip in 1979 was the uh, uh, probably Australia's most iconic and famous 
photograph, uh, wilderness photograph, which was morning mist at Rock Island Bend. And it was uh, Bob Brown who saw this photograph when Peter showed him and immediately knew that it was the photograph that was going to help save the Franklin River. And from that point, it was reproduced many thousands of times uh, in newspaper, print, posters, uh, etc., all over the country um, with the caption, um, how could you vote for a party that would um, destroy this or, or very similar words. And it was a very powerful um, political <laughs> campaign. And, uh, and that particular image has gone down in the annals of history. Uh, yes, Grant. You want to see the poster? Give me... Yes, we'd love to see the poster. We may as well see it now. Uh, yeah, click to me. Yep. Yeah. Um, did you yeah, just talk and hold it up if you've got it there? Okay, yes. Yeah, so this, is, this is a reproduction of the poster that Nick's talking about, which uh, sits on the wall above my desk. Remind me of the good old days. Can we all see that? Uh, yeah, Grant. You can just hold it up above your face there, Grant. Um, all right. Oh, wow. Well. What, what we'll do is later on, Simon has a, has a photograph of that that we'll see on screen. Okay. Well. Um, so we'll, um, we'll, we'll see it um, with a screen share as well. But it's, um, it's, um, it's a photograph that um, has, that, that practically um, in conjunction with the very hard work from the campaigners and the protesters, um, but it's a, an image that practically saved um, Tasmania's greatest wild river from damming. And um, that's certainly part of the legacy of Peter's that we'll talk about today. He also um, made trips in that era um, down the Denison River and down the Gordon River, down to the splits. In fact, he even had a uh, television crew um, accompany him to the Gordon splits and a small documentary was made about... Um, that journey um, was a bit of a sacrifice for Peter who almost always worked on his own. And, um, uh, but it was done for the purpose of helping save uh, the Franklin. And um, those, those five trips and, uh, and, and some others to the headwaters of Franklin and, and, and um, sort of areas around uh, went into a book that was published um, written by Bob Brown uh, that featured uh, Peter's photos uh, called Wild Rivers, was published in 1983. Um, and we go. Grant's holding it up there, which it's is uh, okay. a, a, pivotal, a pivotal book and a, and a wonderful book and one that, that is still available secondhand um, to, to purchase on eBay and, and places like that, secondhand bookstores. Uh, but it was a, a magnificent, um, magnificent uh, publication that um, assisted with that um, campaign. Although it was about the same time it came out that I think that the Franklin was saved, or very close to that point, it was more the the, the single image of uh, morning mist at Rock Island Bend in the previous um, couple of years that had been the uh, the most uh, used for the campaign. Um, Peter, um, Peter married um, his first wife, wife Gabrielle, in 1974, and they had five children. Um, Peter later uh, divorced Gabrielle and, uh, and married Liz in 1987. Uh, and Liz um, um, has kindly um, allowed us to, um, to share Peter's images for this, um, this talk, and we're very grateful for it. Um, and Liz also <clears throat> continued to publish Peter's work after his death, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to. Um, Peter, um, yes, uh, continued to publish his calendars every year and they were um, very widely uh, purchased around Australia and in Tasmania. Um, at this point, he was um, working full-time as a, as a photographer and uh, he usually spent um, five or six blocks of time during the year um, of you know, up to two weeks where he would go out into the wilderness yeah, that's my understanding, uh, to capture his images. Uh, he unfortunately had a, a heart condition that, that needed um, some, some surgery, and I believe it was in the, um, in the um, early 90s that he had uh, some heart surgery. Um, I might be wrong about that particular date, but, but it was around that time. Um, and that, um, 
that uh, weakened his ability to to go out and get the photographs um, that he did. And I know his wife Liz accompanied accompanied him on many of his trips um, through that period to assist him with his gear. Um, and Abby Bushwalker herself, of course. Uh, in um, 1996, he set out on a journey to the Western Arthurs in Tasmania, uh, which is, uh, for those that don't know, the, we <clears throat> the Western Arthurs is probably Tasmania's most uh, rugged uh, mountain range in the southwest of Tasmania, a very beautiful um, range that has lots of glacial lakes and um, very, um, very difficult bushwalking. Um, Peter set out in March to, um, to go on that trip um, and unfortunately he never came home from that trip. He <clears throat> suffered a heart attack um, on or about the 28th of March 1996 and, um, and died um, and it was, um, a search was sent out when he didn't return um, and Peter was eventually found, uh, I believe, around a week later and I know... Um, Chris um, was, was part of that search party and no doubt he'll touch on that at some stage. Um, following his death, he was working on a third book, which was um, uh, published that same year, uh, posthumously um, called On the Mountain. And it was a collection, a very, very fine collection of photographs from his backyard being uh, Mount Wellington, as it was known then, or Kanani Mount, Mount Wellington as it's known now. And we've got uh, that Wonderful yeah. book. Here we go. Yep, yeah. that's it, it's it's a magnificent book, um, and um, very it, it is a bit difficult and expensive to get hold of these days. But if you ever do come across it, please <laughs> purchase it if you can afford it. Uh, you'll never regret it. Um, in 1998, um, a, uh, a collection of his work. Um, quite a comprehensive collection of his work, well, not, sorry, not comprehensive, but a, a, a very uh, good collection of his work was published, um, which was called uh, well, uh, Folio. Um, and that was published in two versions, um, a hardback and a hardback in a slipcase. Um, again, a very difficult publication to get hold of these days, but if you do, okay. there's Grant holding it up. Yep, just talk, talk again, Grant, while you hold that up. <laughs> Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's it. <laughs> um, and it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. Um, it's probably worth mentioning at this point, actually, that um, um, five of Peter's seven books were, um, were uh, printed and published by Rod Poole, um, who Peter worked with, uh, a, uh, a master printer in, um, in Melbourne. And uh, Peter worked very closely with Rod to produce um, his books and calendars um, in the way that um, he, he wished them to be um, produced, um, certainly for the um, Wild Rivers. And uh, no doubt that vision was continued uh, through his calendars. Um, and then uh, and Liz uh, worked with Rod uh, following uh, Peter's death on the, the books that followed from there. Um, in 2001, um, In the Forest was produced, um, which was a, a book based on, on, on trees. And it wasn't just Tasmanian trees. It has um, some beautiful pictures of some, some tropical trees um, from um, uh, Queensland and Borneo um, and uh, places such as that. Um, and it was uh, written with uh, Professor Jamie Kirkpatrick, who also contributed to uh, a number of the other books with his essays on ecology and the natural world in Tasmania and um, we're very grateful for, for James insights in Peter's books and um, and uh, it's a, a wonderful a wonderful contribution to be able to read those inside the books as well it gives context to what you're actually looking at um, in 2006 um, the book simply was produced again uh, an amazing book and Grant's holding it up now if you just yeah. talk Grant here we go again. We'll see that. Good. Yeah, beautiful. Which is um, obviously on the cover, featuring uh, featuring Peter um, um, uh, looking through his um, Lindhoff Technica four by five camera um, on the on the cover. There, that's probably one of the easier books to get hold of um, these days. It's a it's a, a fantastic book. Uh, it was one hundred and ten dollars when it was first published. Uh, so. 
you wouldn't expect it for anything less than that and probably more around the $150 mark to get hold of um, in, in these days, unless you're very lucky. Um, the, his, um, Liz continued printing his um, calendars until I think the last one was 2009. Um, and um, at that point, um, she decided that that was, um, that was uh, the, an appropriate um, end point for that. Uh, however, um, his uh, work now uh, lives on uh, through the work that Simon has been doing. Um, and also um, the, um, uh, a book was published in 2017 um, called Journeys into the Wild, um, Peter Dombroskis, um, which is a, a very easy book to get hold of and it's, um, it's quite cheap. And we'll talk uh, probably a little bit more about that book um, a bit later, but um, that, um, that's certainly one that, that most people will um, be able to get hold of very easily if they want to see Peter's work. But that's a, a very long but brief <laughs> overview of, um, of Peter's journey in publishing and, and conservation and photography. And obviously, there's far more to Peter's life than what I've just mentioned now. And, uh, and certainly, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about it as we go. But uh, thanks for sitting through that. And uh, I, guess, um, I guess now we'll, um, we'll, we'll move on to maybe... Um, uh, talking uh, maybe Chris about um, about um, how you knew came to know Peter and um, and your early recollections of him. I, I, I met him in uh, 1976, I think it was. There was a slideshow at the town hall, and I had a, a small, uh, rather terrible uh, pr production, I suppose you could say. And uh, Peter came up to me later and. Uh, invited him to his house and we and uh he showed me his incredible book collection um and uh yeah it was the beginning of a pretty close relationship uh i should point out that peter was as i am first and foremost a naturalist and that's how he saw himself uh rather than as a photographer and uh, i guess that's how i see myself too a, a bit so we're we're naturalists first and foremost and photography is this a separate part of that, a pretty intense part, but nevertheless, um, that's how we saw it. Um, and just just touching briefly, I'm probably rambling a little bit here, but you mentioned before the wonderful book, Wild Rivers, and I, I think that to me is the culmination of, of Peter's work in some respects, because out of all the books I've got at home, uh, and I've got thousands of them, and been collecting books for many, many years. Um, when I go back and look at most of the earlier books that I've acquired, you look at them now and think, hmm, yeah, it's pretty, pretty hopeless and, uh, or, you know, I've gone past that. But I can still get Peter's Wild, River, Wild Rivers book out and look at it and be entranced by it. It's still a, an extraordinary book, uh, you know, after all this time, in, in 1983, whenever it was published, uh, it wasn't allowed to be produced as evidence at the uh, oh, on uh, on uh, technical matters, but uh, nevertheless, it's still one of the most outstanding books, and it's still I, I still go back to it, and, and I'm amazed at you know the the magic of it. It's a it's a magical book. I, I guess the best way for me to contribute tonight is is. For people to ask me questions rather than me going on a long ray, because I find that the most difficult thing to do, and where it's just easy to answer a question. Uh, but suffice to say, to say, uh, you know, we had a pretty intense relationship. It was a, you know, he was a great friend, and it was a, a, a sad day when when he died. It was a, a big shock to me, and uh, a bit of a a wake up call that uh, no one's. Uh, Immortal and um, will be an end for, for all of us. Uh, yeah, that's why we've got to jam as much into our lives as possible. Yeah, ab absolutely. What were your what were your first your first impressions of, of Peter when you, um, you you met him in that day in nineteen seventy six? Obviously, you had a fairly quick connection, but what were your, your impressions of of him as a person and and um, and, and what he was about? I suppose. Um. Uh, how can I? Uh, 
Yeah, I, 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 uh, I guess uh, our, our love of nature was was what it was all about. Um, but I, I think one of the differences between us was that he was a professional right from day one, where it took me 20 or 30 years to really knuckle down to why I was doing what I was doing and, and what makes a good photograph and what makes a bad photograph. And uh, I think that about Peter was that he was incredibly professional right from right from the word go. And when we went to Macquarie Island, and, and uh, I should point out that his heart murmur, which is he was selected for, by an Ari to go down to Macquarie Island, and right at the last moment when he had the medical, they, they picked up his heart murmur. And so wow. they knocked him back. And and he said to me, look, bugger it, why don't we just uh, organise our own fishing boat and go down? So we went <laughs> into the wharves and asked all these fishermen, would they be prepared to take us to Macquarie Island? And some of them said, yeah, we'll take it for $100,000. And, of course, that was out of the question, of course. <laughs> so in desperation, P- Peter put it out in the paper and... and uh, a New Zealand fellow just happened to be in with his 36 foot catch, and uh, it went from there. And it was so Peter's uh, heart mover, which was incredibly unfortunate, of course, but it got us to Macquarie Island, which was one of the best things both of us had ever done, and still remains, you know, one of the most remarkable things I've ever done. And the difference between us there is that I was buggerising around taking snapshots uh, and trying to be professional about it and I managed to bring back home a few little things that I'm happy with but by and large it was a squandered opportunity from the point of view that if that was now it would be an entirely different story yeah. um, but it still remains uh, one of the most wonderful things we've ever done. Yeah, yeah it's um, it's certainly not the thing you can do now you can't just uh, hop on a fishing catch and offload yourself at Macquarie Island which no, you can't, fun. and that's right. The restrictions now are enormous, and uh, we had free rain then, and it was just wonderful. And then to finish up at the end of it, going to the Auckland Islands and then back to New Zealand where, where we terminated the trip, it was just, just just a fabulous experience. Yeah, wonderful. And you it was uh, you also went with um, with Jeff Lee, is that right? Yes, that's right, yeah. He was, yeah. He was the deckhand. <laughs> right. Well, that was one of the requirements that Mark wanted... Uh, uh, a deckhand because uh, you know it's pretty serious at uh, that degree of latitude and, uh, and and it wasn't without some sort of trepidation that we went but I had great faith in this bloke as a uh, as a skipper and uh, and the boat you know it was a, a 36 foot catch but it, it was a, a robust vessel built built for the Trans Tasman race in 1936 and uh, I felt comfortable and. Everybody got seasick, of course, but um, it was yeah, it was quite a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Yeah, what an adventure! Can I ask a question? So, I was really intrigued by your definition of of Peter and yourself in terms of that separation between naturalist and photographer. Could you maybe explain more in depth what you mean by that, and particularly what a naturalist represents in particular? Well, Peter's comment about uh, when he goes out there, he's uh, he's going home. Is, is that's the way I feel, and uh, um, it's about it's it, boy oh boy. If, if there's one thing to try and nail down, it, it's it's that it's it's why we're out there doing what we do. And photography, of course, it's a big part of that, for, and it was for both of us, but. Uh, it's pretty important just to be there uh, because that's where we feel uh, safe uh, of all things. I know that people have written about uh, Peter uh, saying things like, you know, he was out in a place that in one one respect he feared, and and that's absolute rubbish. I mean, we don't fear being out there. It's it's being back in civilization that I fear. (laughs) But being back out there is is, that's where I'm alive and... uh, that's what it's all about. It's 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 seeing the world around you and uh, immersing yourself in it. It's, it's this engagement with it that's of crucial uh, importance to us. It's yeah. a lousy answer, I know. It's a, uh, it's the most difficult thing to try and uh, put into words. Well, I think his his images speak for it uh, a lot of the time. Um, sure. 
as, mm. my, as most people can, can attest to and all of us. But one thing I wonder, Chris, is, is how you saw maybe Peter's intentionality behind his work evolve in terms of the purpose, like how you met him and then how it developed through the time you knew him. Sorry, Paul, just, just repeat the question, mate. <laughs> I missed it. So how, how would you describe, knowing Chris as well, I mean, sorry, Peter, as well as you did, how would you describe the intentionality behind his photography changing? Did, he, did you feel like there was a development in terms of the, the output and the purpose behind his imagery, moving from personal to professional to conservation? Like, like how did you see it sort of evolving from the time that you knew him in terms of what his personal motivations were in terms uh, of taking the images in the first place? I know this might sound silly, but I, I'm not sure the work did develop. I think it was, it was just first class to begin with. And uh, uh, what, he, what he did in the end was just produce different stuff. But, but the professionalism was there right from the word go. And uh, um, but, but, but I know somebody once said to Elliot Porter that he was taking photos for conservation and he refuted it. But I remember at the time reading it thinking, oh, gee, that's, that's terrible. But I understood what he meant. Uh, I mean, essentially, we take our photographs because they're important to us at the time uh, and it's important to nail what's in front of us. Uh, and conservation uh, is secondary. I mean, it, it, that might sound crude, but um, sure, our work works for conservationists, but essentially we take those images for personal reasons. Mm. Yeah. 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 And I, I, think, I think all of us here would say the same thing. Really. Yeah. I, I can't speak for all of you, but I, I'm sure there's, there's, that, there's that element when we look at something, it, it's that excitement that, that something is fantastic is, is working for us right in front of us. And the only thing we're thinking about is not conservationists, though we know that we can use that material for conservationists, for conservation, I should say, but, but largely it's, 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 it's the, the magic of what's in front of us and, and our intention to, to capture it as best we can for, for that uh, image to, to speak to other people. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, Chris, um, uh, I just got a question. Is that okay, Nick? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Chris, would you therefore say, that, though, that um, when Peter chose to do the first and subsequent of his river trips, the Franklin River trips, even though he might have been going into it with the, you know, the mindset that you're just talking about, it was still with the intention of capturing images of areas that are threatened, therefore knowing that they might be useful for other purposes later. Oh, sure, yeah. I, I mean, of course. I mean, he was he was uh, 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 disturbed by the fact that that river was was going to be destroyed, as we all were, and and it's just just a shame that the Lake Pitta dispute wasn't happening. You know. Now, for example, because they wouldn't have got away with what they got with what they got away with, but certainly when he went down the the Franklin, the the object of the exercise was to amass as much material as a, as he could in order to to safeguard the place for sure. Yeah, but he would have certainly enjoyed himself being out there, and I guess that relates right. back to your your yeah. point, Chris, that yeah. he. He, yes, he would have been. He wouldn't be doing it if he didn't want to be in the place. Um, and, and obviously, the conservation um, would have been um, uh, equally important at that time. But um, but you know, he just simply wouldn't have gone if he didn't want to be there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. And he didn't want to see through the lens and, and see the wilderness around him and, uh, and and capture those those photographs. Yeah. Did. did um, did Peter ever talk to you um, much about Alagus? I was just going to ask that. Uh, curiously, no, he didn't. Um, um, we, we touched on it, but I guess uh, no, no, we didn't. I mean, it, it was never really a, a subject that was, I mean, it wasn't that he didn't want to ever talk about it, but it, it, I guess he'd moved on, I, I suppose. Yeah. 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 And, and I guess probably. In a historical context, we now recognise the importance of that relationship in in Peter's development and in conservation, and in, uh, in, in yeah, it's something we recognise more now than than would have been so conscious, I suppose, uh, when you um, you met him and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, just like you yeah, you wouldn't you know, talk about some 
some subjects these days, and then you, you, your grandchildren um, talk about you in revered terms about something mundane that you did. I'm not saying the relationship was mundane, of course, but it's just an example, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm rabbiting on now. <laughs> Chris, how, would you, how did you feel about the documentary that was made about that relationship? Um, wild, the wild documentary. And just for the audience to know, there is quite a wonderful, very powerful, uh, about an hour-long feature-length documentary made largely about the relationship between, between Peter and Elagus and the, de the development of, you know, the conservation movement in and around, I guess, the storyline of, of who they were as, as men. To, to be absolutely frank with you, it's been a while since I've, uh, since I've seen it and I've got them at home, so I should make a bit of an effort of, of looking at them, but it is... I confess, a while since I've looked at them. So mm -hmm. I, so much as so much time has moved on, I I can't actually relate to them. I'd have to go back and have a look at them. Well, I, I believe Restore Pet is actually um, doing a screening in the town hall soon. Okay, yeah. right on. Yeah. Um, that that documentary is, of course, called Wildness, and it was produced in two thousand and three. Um, and Chris um, is one of the um, one of the the people interviewed uh, for that documentary. Um, it, it's interesting you should say that you, you don't go, you haven't seen it for a while, Chris, because I know uh, myself and I know a lot of landscape photographers, um, or particularly Tasmanian ones, I suppose, of, of my era tend to watch it quite frequently, um, which may freak you out a bit, but um, <laughs> it, it's actually, it's actually, uh, it's almost like a pilgrimage to watch it because it is such a powerful documentary and it's so beautiful. Um, and I guess it speaks for my generation and the influence that, um, that um, uh, Peter's work has had on my generation uh, as a photographer, I suppose, and, and, and indeed your own work. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it's actually available on YouTube to watch. Um, so those that are watching it, if you search wildness uh, and probably Don Boscus as well, You'll uh, you'll get that up. It's a it's a it's a beautiful documentary. Sit down and watch it for yeah. It's about an hour long or so, but it, it does explain a lot about um, Peter's life and Peter's relationship um, with the Lagos, and a lot about the Lagos's life as well. Um, there's lots of um, anecdotes from from people such as Chris, such as Bob Brown, other people. Um, um, his wife Liz features prominently. His um, uh, first wife um, Gabrielle features. Um, and so uh, you do get a, a great insight. And also Melva uh, Trahanis, uh, um, a wife, who um, thankfully is still with us and, uh, and, and, and very supportive of, uh, of photography and, and conservation in Tasmania as well. And uh, it really is beautiful. So, so do, do watch that. Um, Can I make a comment on that, Nick? Uh, one thing that I was left with that sort of helped separate and define Peter's work is... Elagus's work was was very open and kind of um, fast moving and and light in terms of equipment, and it was very inclusive of people and children and and uh, the human human kind of relationship with landscape. and And Peter chose a different path, and that he moved to more heavier, slower sort of type of equipment of a higher caliber, and and he almost made a point of excluding people from all his imagery. And I was wondering if you had any sort of comments of, about how that spoke to who Peter was and, and how he chose to to interpret the world through through his camera. Yeah, yeah I, I would comment on that because it's one thing that sort of irritates me a little bit when people are critical of photographers who exclude people, uh, mm -hmm. and particularly by Aboriginal people making this sort of stuff, that it's somehow a cultural dispossession of, of land and stuff like that because we never include people in it. The reason we don't include people in it is because it takes away from what the photographer is trying to get people to concentrate on. And the moment you have a person in the picture, then people's attention is directed to what they're wearing or, oh, my God, I've got a shirt like that or whatever. And, and you, you, you want people's full attention on the tree, the, uh, the, 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 what you're trying to do, the, the, the abstraction of it all or, or the, the way you're... The way you're uh, arranging things because that's what it's all about and a, a human being in in that sort of stuff is not a deliberate thing to 
to take away from the fact that humans have never even been there and got out. It's just basically so people's attention is focused on what they should be focused on. Yeah, yeah. I certainly agree with that sentiment. Not everyone does, of course, <laughs> Chris, but uh, for, certainly when we're talking about wilderness photography in Tasmania, it's a, an element that's um, um, usually, um, um, usually at the fore, the fact that there are no people in, in these photographs. And I think Peter famously said, um, I think it's mentioned in the documentary, I think he said something to the point of, well, I was there and I was, but I was just on the other side of the camera. So there was a, a, a person there, mm. but just not in the frame that you're looking at. And yeah. um, I'm paraphrasing, it's not exactly what he said, but, um, but he did say something similar because he got asked about it all the time. And, um, and just on your point, Paul, um, you're talking about Elagos and including uh, people in his photographs. I mean, Elagos lost most of his photography in the 67 bushfire. And he had five years between that point and, um, uh, well, four and a half years between that point and when he, I don't know, it would be five, uh, when he died. Um, and his children were um, featured prominently in some of those photographs. And they're some of the most beautiful photographs you'll see of Lake Pedder. But that was the relationship that Elagus had with, with Pedder at that time. Um, he was clearly, uh, and he would go off without the children, obviously, and take the wilderness photographs too. But he did have the children there because they were there with him. They were there enjoying um, Lake, Lake Pedder before it, uh, before it was dammed. Um, also, he, he took them up Mount Anne, I know, from the photographs I've seen. And um, I, I guess it was a choice of circumstance. I, I simply don't know, and I don't know if anyone else knows what it, the legacy work was was like before that. Did he feature, or did he include people often in his work before that point? I I, I doubt it because his children probably weren't around. Uh, they were too, were too young or, or or hadn't been born yet. Um, he was travelling solo trips down the down the, the Gordon and and the Denison and, and 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 into other many wild places. Franklin Range, the Western Arthur's Federation Peak. And I'm, I'm figuring, being solo, that there probably aren't too many um, pictures of people there. But it's probably a point to make for anyone that's watching this in the future that, yes, Elagos did have people in his photographs and uh, some very, very fine photographs of people in wilderness, um, particularly like Petter, his children. Uh, but it was probably more the circumstance um, of that time period, I suppose. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Chris, uh, an another aspect that I'd love you to reflect on is how do you feel like the qualities of who Peter was as a person came through in his imagery? Gee, that's a tough one, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Very yeah, deeply I, philosophical one. I'm not sure I could that. answer that. <laughs> in <laughs> fact, I can't answer it. <laughs> well, here's another question then. How, what sort of qualities do you feel like describe Peter's work? How would you sort of present that in, in words to someone to, to summate kind of what makes Peter's work really Peter's work? Well, I, I suppose he was a fairly softly spoken fellow and, and he, he wasn't a braggart or anything like that. So that possibly comes through in his, in his imagery. He's... And, and possibly one of the reasons he concentrates a fair bit on close-up as well as drama um because there's that quietness of 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 some of those some of these images which may reflect his personality i i, I don't know so that's a that's tough a, one that's, a... that's the best i can do <laughs> <laughs> you're a very honest man chris <laughs> i love that <laughs> um are there any other questions from our, our panel at the moment, Luke? Do you have yeah, any? we've had a question on um, YouTube, actually, and it's more around the um, compositional um, choices that Peter made in his photos. Um, is there any view as to why um, a lot of his compositions um, are, are more of a portrait orientation rather than a landscape? Is it based on restrictions he had with the, the uh, I guess, the... Uh, Focal lengths that he had, or um, to try and accentuate the foreground, or um, is is there any um, I, I, views on that? I reckon I can probably answer that by by saying that 
because he largely produced uh, vertical calendars, uh, that's how he, he not so much saw landscape, but that's how he had to uh, discipline himself to make sure that he got vertical photographs so he could use them in the calendar. And, and if you look at his diaries, which are, I think, some of the most wonderful stuff that he did, or in some respects better than the calendars, and possibly because he had the choice of horizontals and verticals. So I, I guess it's one of the problems when you're doing a, a, a vertical calendar is, is you're really restricted to seeing things vertically. And I tend to think that most landscapes are horizontal in nature. I, I think if m most people who are, aren't working to a, a vertical calendar or something like that, if they're just out there photographing, will probably find when they add their images up that 90% of them are probably horizontal. But that doesn't mean to say that verticals don't work, as they most assuredly do. But uh, I think because Peter's work was largely featuring in, 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 in vertical calendars, that's how he had to essentially work. Yeah. Right, can I make mm. a comment on that as well? Yeah. Um, so Peter worked with a 4 you know, by 5-inch camera. Um, and, and I think one of the things that is probably... Um, really characteristic of his work is this, you know, I sort of refer to it as a sweep from foreground to background. Um, so he used to shoot a lot, I think, with a 90 mil wide <laughs> angle on his, on his um, large format. <laughs> and because he had the luxury of camera movements on his, on his um, 4 or 5 camera, he was able to manipulate that focus and that um, perspective control um, with the camera too. And so I think a lot of the work that I think of with his verticals is this beautiful you know, in large foreground detail, it might be a cushion plant and then sweeping away to, you know, a mountain range in the background and being able to control the focus in that. Yeah. Um, but in some ways, that's almost more enhanced in a vertical composition um, using that technique as well. Um, yeah. So, you know, I don't know if that played into it, but when I think yeah. of his images, that's, that's a, a particular feature of his images that yeah. I recognise a lot. Um, and we can show some of those a little bit later on. Mm. I mean, you kind of answered with this question to some extent, but why was Peter particularly drawn to a large format system, you know, relative to, say, his mentor like Elagas, who was, who was moving with, you know, rapidly around and taking a lot of volume of work with a 35 mil system, and Peter chose to choose what is quite a difficult system to, to travel with and <laughs> with very limited capacity to take volume of images, and, and that I, I think why he, he was doing what he's doing. I, I think because of quality. It's basically the bigger the bigger the image, uh, the better the reproduction. And I think that you know if you look at uh, by comparison, the latest stuff falls down, and it probably falls down. I'm trying to be as fair as I can here uh, because he used stuff which is pretty antiquated when we look at it now. He used the the first. Zoom ever made of 43 to 86 Nikon, I think, and it was a crappy lens. And, <laughs> you know, if, if, if the man would have been using the stuff we're using today, it would have been a different kettle of fish. And, but certainly, uh, you know, Peter, just the overseas work that was being done with large format, that, that's, that's if you wanted to, you know, express that sort of degree of quality, uh, then you really needed to be using large format. And... I guess that's what, and, and, and he also believed that, that slowed you down and uh, rather than snapping off. I, I certainly don't believe that, that, as some people do, that it teaches you to be, um, if you're using 35 mil, you tend to be blasting off and, and hence your images aren't going to be as valuable or as, as, as uh, uh, profound as, as somebody who's using a slow system. I don't, I don't subscribe to that for one moment because... It depends on just how, how you're using the equipment, uh, not what it is, but certainly uh, by using slow things, you just you are forced to slow down and uh, and and make every every movement deliberate. Oh. Chris, could you describe to the audience like what that meant in reality? So, if Peter's going out on a on a two week trip, what are the sort of number of images that he's coming back with, or, or that he has the capacity to even shoot? Uh, he, he'd probably take uh, a couple of uh, graphmatics like I used, used to do as well and, and it probably took about uh, 40 sheets of film and, which you had to uh, go into a changing bag. It was a fairly laborious and horrible thing and 
for anybody that's ch- tried to change film in a changing bag in Kakadu, for example, it's a nightmare. <laughs> and you're sweating and, and uh, all the rest of it. So it's a fairly tedious, tedious thing. But on the other hand, what, if the compositions are, or, or, or if the depth of field limitations aren't really severe, you can take a picture in, real, in a relatively short period of time. Once you, I, I work with a, a, a optical viewfinder and I just size things up that way and, and it's just a lot easier to, okay, that's, that's what I want to do and then you chuck something on a tripod and if it's a fairly simple arrangement of depth of field, you can, you can um, take a picture fairly quickly. It's when things become really, really complicated and you're dealing with complex images where there's things not lying in the one plane and things like that. It's a little more laborious. And, uh, but, so you, you can be relatively quick, but that's, that's probably what he'd take, uh, 40 sheets or something like that with him. Yeah. Once interviewed um, Liz Dombrovskis for um, an Australian Geographic article and she mentioned when she was out with him that she couldn't recall a photograph that he took that took any less than 15 minutes. So <laughs> that um, yeah, does speak to the level of time put into the composition and, and setting things up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we might, um, we might get on to um, maybe um, talking about um, his publications a little bit more. I know, um, Grant, you wanted to, um, to talk a, a bit about them. Um, uh, his calendars and um, in his books. So I guess I don't know where the best place to start with that is. Um, what would you like to start with, Grant? Uh, well, I just had a couple of points, really, um, which uh, others can pick up on and elaborate on. But, yes, I mean, his calendars have been touched upon, so I'll just uh, put something up and share the screen here. Hang on. Where do I find the screen share button? Yeah. Down the bottom. Yep, he's got it. There you go. Okay. Oh God. Oh, yeah. Okay, I just um, I scan these are all of the one all of the images I'm going to show just now are, are scans from uh, either old calendars or books, so they uh, certainly don't do justice to the quality of the original images or the original publication. Mm. But um, I mean, many of you uh, out there have, have heard of and probably own. Um, various in his calendars, but I thought it was just interesting where where they started from. The first first couple were like the ones on the left. They're more like a sort of Tasmania, pretty Tasmania calendar within which there were some wild photos. But I think the, the one on the right, um, the 1976 calendar is the first one that was actually called a wilderness calendar and um, all the rest is history. Oh, that, does that sound right, Chris? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so these were the these are the oldest ones I've got, but there were one or two before '75, I think, which I might have seen Nick flash up. Yeah, I'll I'll turn I'll turn off my background, and you can see my beautiful. After 50 shows, we finally get to see what what what. Oh, what come on, <laughs> one so. Well, yeah, it's just a just a study there. It's a bit of a mess, <laughs> but um, this is his very very first one, Tasmania '73, and obviously um, it was published in. 1972, and it is um, Lake Pedder uh, on the front cover, which is the most obvious choice for that year, being the year that we lost the most magnificent place, um, one of the most magnificent places on the face of the planet, um, which was dammed um, under the, um, the scheme. But if we look here quickly, I'll just show illustrate uh, Grant's point about the sort of images that he was producing. That's Constitution Dock at Hobart. Um, and there's wilderness photographs in here, of course. Uh, but if we go a little bit further, we've got Port Arthur, and there's ones of the Shock Tower, um, and um, and a couple of others like that. So that's uh, the point uh, you're making, Grant. Uh, I, I don't reckon anyone could see that, could they? Because uh, you're still sharing their screen. Your screen. <laughs> I would have seen it in a little box in the corner, but um... oh, okay. I no, need to stop and share before. No, no, know. don't, 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 don't. I think I've made the point. We won't. Yeah, no, I mean, I, even like, um, you know, the quiet land, there's um, yeah. images of the shot tower and things like that. So, yes. um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely uh, more of an exploration around Tasmania than necessarily um, out in the bush. Yeah. Anyway, Greg, continue. Uh, yeah, so that's one point. And uh, the other thing I was going to say is um, a completely different point. Um, Chris sort of touched on this, but, but for me personally, um, 
the, the images of Peters that um, I find most, most interesting and can look at all day are his details. Mm. Whereas I suspect out in the, the greater world, he's thanks to the likes of Rockwell and Bend and Lake Oberon, he's perhaps better known for his landscapes. So I've, uh, I've been through a few of my collection of calendars and books and just uh, grabbed a few uh, of his detailed images that appeal to me just to remind people that uh, that's, um, that was another one of his great skills. And uh, he often included several of these in the wilderness calendars, but they're probably best represented again, as Chris said, in, uh, in the diaries, which uh, only five or six, I think, were ever produced in the late 80s. So if anyone wants to comment on any of these, feel free. I'll just click through them slowly. This one was produced as a poster. I'm not sure who by, whether it was by Peter himself or by the Wilderness Society. But um, so it looked fantastic as a poster. But I, and I used to have it on my wall, but I can't find it now. Mm. So I think the, these kind of images speak to one of the qualities that, that Peter's often um, associated with with his work is there's a certain level of sensuality to his work um, in a really look at, look at the curves there. way. Mm. You know, like that, that you could take that in a lot of different ways, but you know that last one you you could almost give a, a very feminine quality to that in many ways. Mm. Um, in terms of the sim symbology in there and the, and the um, aesthetics, but yeah, beautiful level of sensuous curves are, is a quite a big part of his work, I thought, especially in his detailed work. Mm. Mm. I really like this because you don't instantly notice the, uh, the seahorse exoskeleton. Yeah, that's right. Ah, uh, yeah. Tell me what to see it. Yeah. It's almost like it's hanging. It's what it would be doing underwater, but it's, yeah. Yeah. And um, well, someone, this might come up later too, but uh, Peter um, travelled outside and photographed outside Tasmania a bit um, in, from the mid 80s onwards. And uh, one of his, I think, earliest trips was to uh, Borneo, Malaysian part of Borneo. And that's where this one's taken from. And there's a few other fantastic images from that trip too that appeared in, well, in these wilderness calendars at, at times, but also more, more probably in the diaries. That's all I've got. Okay, I'll give yeah. you back the screen. It, it, is, it is beautiful work. It, um, yeah, I, I certainly concur about the um, the, the detail shots. They're, they're, they're very, very interesting, and there's some, some magnificent um, other ones in his books um, that are that are worth uh, seeking out. Um, there's a particular one of some curled up kelp, or not kelp, but uh, yeah, but it's it's naturally curled in a in a sort of like a um, what are they called? A spiral? What are they oh, called? Yeah. Spiral. What is it? A... Yeah. I think I've got that one, Nick. Yes. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. See later. It's yeah. Great to see that one, but it's 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 beautiful, and it's almost like um, uh, the the things that he's found in detail. They're almost like he's then sort of arranged it himself. Now I know absolutely he didn't or wouldn't have done that, um, but it's so some of it. Some of the details are so perfect. Um, that you think, you know, how, you know how, how does nature do this? And just, you know, it's been washed up, this seaweed on the shore, and it's fallen in that way. And then this man has come along with a camera and then found it and, and, and found it interesting enough to actually to get the camera out and photograph and present it to us. And I think that's part of uh, the, the, the legacy of his, uh, his images, uh, just those, those things that he found that others didn't find or others don't find, that others walk by. Um, and I'm sure I speak for everyone else on the panel and, and plenty of our viewers that, that one of the absolute joys of landscape photography is after dramatic things have happened in the light and, and whatnot, you then start looking very closely at the beach and you start looking closely at the forest floor and you, and you um, search around and just sort of wonder about all these little things, and it makes you appreciate everything in a in a in a hyper. It's almost like a you, you go into a sort of a hyper sense. I, I don't know about you, Chris. You you would uh, find that sometimes your detail work is 
second to none. And um, and clearly, you would spend a lot of time with these thoughts, I would suppose. Yeah, and I think that um, uh, I, I think you could you could tell if something's arranged. It, it just doesn't look right. I, I no. think so. Uh, and and there's the ethical component of the course, and you don't need to do that. And you're a phony if you do that. I, I think, but um, completely agree. Yeah, and it's just a, a matter of searching hard enough, and you'll and you'll find it. And, uh, and sometimes it's almost by mistake. And you'll—I mean, just recently I was down at Black Swan Lagoon, and it was that horrible day when it was 32 degrees in uh, Houston or something like that, and and there were 30 knot winds blowing, and it was yucky. Uh, and I got out, and it was, and I thought, gee, I don't even want to get the camera out because it's just hand blowing everywhere. And I managed to, to get something quite that I was quite really happy with. It was just happened to be this little thing that was just lying there. And, uh, you know, I was just lucky enough to to grab it and, and there it was. So it's just a matter of searching hard enough and, and you'll find something quite magical. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it also, um, just for, for photographers out there that might be starting out or, or uh, just picking up landscape photography, um, there's always something to photograph. Um, if the light's not working for you and you haven't got your dramatic stuff and uh, you haven't found that epic composition that's going to work brilliantly on Instagram for you. Um, uh, sorry, I had to throw that in. Um, start, start looking at the detail. You don't necessarily need epic light to capture no, you the don't. detail no. shot. No. You need to train your eye, though. You need to look at things and you need to... Um, uh, but you need to be interested as well. You, have, you actually have to be interested in what you're looking at. And so if you are interested and in looking, you'll find things and you'll find things that are that are really quite wonderful. And just if you go into the sand dunes and start looking at what the bird tracks are doing and what the little bugs are doing when they move from one one lump of sand to the next, they're creating mm. patterns and beautiful things and they're, they're all ephemeral. They change every time. Like you'll go there tomorrow and they'll, be completely different. Yeah. Mm. You'll find these little things and you look for them. And, and I think really one of the things that Peter's work taught me was that, that if you look at the ground and you look around and you're interested and you want to be interested in what you're, you're looking at, then you'll find things. And, um, yeah, and to me that's you know, a small part of his, his legacy personally, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, and I, what, some person once said to me that, cameras get in the way of seeing. And, uh, I, and I corrected the person by saying that that's not it at all. In fact, a camera has enabled me to, to be much closer to nature than I ever would have been without a camera. Mm. And, and be, be, because I'm searching for those things now, because the more I search, the more I find. And, and I wouldn't have done that without a camera, I think. Uh I think that could be too why um why Peter's work does look so perfect in some senses because he's seen so much stuff he's been out there so much that um, ultimately you will come across those scenes that that just work so well. Hmm. Well, I feel like um, Nick has, has started to open up the conversation about how Peter has influenced us as individuals as photographers. Does does Rob or, or Grant or Simon or anyone want to speak a little bit to that? Like how they feel like the quality and caliber and, and style of his work as, as, and, and who he was as a man has influenced you as a photographer. What about you, Rob? Unquestionably, but I think less so as time goes on. Like certainly at the beginning and the, the sweep of Peter's compositions that Simon was, was describing before, like we've all done that. We've all gone hunting that sort of, you know, close detail, some line, a little stream or a line of rocks or vegetation leading to a nice little mountain range in the background. I, I mean, I speak for myself. Certainly, yes, I've done that. Um, but I don't do it, I certainly don't do it consciously anymore. And I don't, you know, all of we four have been doing this for a while and you, and you guys as well. Um, and you get into your own space, your own techniques and so on through time. Um, but yes, certainly, formatively, there's no doubt that Peter's work, you know, had an extraordinary influence on so many photographers and probably still does for people, you know, starting out before they find their own rabbit hole to go down. Rob, mm. was it one of the reasons that you moved into large format as well? Well, exactly the same as the reason 
that Chris said, um, the detail. Mm. You know, I went from 35 mil to six by nine, six by seven, and then moved to four by five because the camera I had for the medium format, six by seven or six by nine, had the same mm. mechanisms as a large format camera. So you know, I thought, why stop in the middle, go the whole way? And I've always loved detail in an image. Um, and I just wanted, yeah, um, that, that line from Liz saying that you know, Peter's photograph was a minimum of 15 minutes. When you're there working with a view camera, it doesn't seem like 15 minutes. Um, you know, this happens today with any camera, but certainly when you're engaged with the mechanics um, of a view camera and thinking about the planes and movements and, you know, fitting everything in and the, the, the ground glass, glass screen being upside down and back to front, getting the focuses all correct, time just goes. Like, yeah. And it's it's a nice process. It still happens with digital cameras for sure. And nowadays it happens more. Um, you know, you just get in the, you, it's a different process because you're getting feedback from the digital camera from the screen and yeah. the shots you might take. But also yeah. every large format, every click is has a certain cost attached and a certain yeah, consumption rate. Right. And, you know, with digital, you can click away very happily and, and no problem. But yeah, the, you really want to make sure you get it right. Yeah, it's 10 bucks. And like we were bucks. talking before, Chris was saying Peter would take 40 sheets of film. It's a terribly small amount. You know, most of us would blaze that off in five minutes today. Mm -hmm. But if you think, because you know the value of that film, if you can come back with even half of that number or a quarter of that number of good shot, shots or an eighth of that number, <laughs> you get you know, five or six good shots from a week away, you're going to be pretty happy. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask you, Rob, while, while we're, we're talking about um, talking about that, um, you, if I remember correctly, you first came to Tasmania in the middle of the Franklin Dam uh, campaign. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So you would have been very conscious of, of Peter's work. Were you taking photographs at that point yourself? Uh, it's good you reminded me because actually Peter's work was the reason I came here, now that I think about it. <laughs> I mean, there, you go. <laughs> there, was, there was other other things happening, but I was in Canberra at uni and I bought his calendars and there's a couple of pictures that appeared in the calendars. And I just thought, um, you know, it wasn't a conscious thought, but you know, they really lodged in my heart. And, you know, when the uni finished and I came down here for a three week holiday, it was definitely a part of the, 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 the impetus for me to come was those few images of Peter's that had really, uh, you know, grabbed me. Yeah, and I guess now thinking about your life's work since that point, Peter's legacy has had a, a profound um, opening opening up for you and, and certainly for others as well, but particularly you, um, that his work influenced you to come here and then you came here and then you stayed here and then you took up um, the, the photography and you took up the conservation message and you've continued with that all your life. So when we're talking about that in a in a legacy in a in, in his legacy's point of view, that's fairly profound. I mean that's quite that's quite amazing. And I, I guess you're not the only example, but um, maybe maybe talk a bit more about um, that, that dam campaign and, 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 and what you were seeing and, and, and how it led you through um, sort of relating back to the initial images, I suppose. For me, it was never a conscious thing. I sort of, you know, as I said, I came down here with the intention of a three-week cross-country skiing holiday. There was no snow and so I wandered into the Wilderness Society. I hadn't planned to come down here and live. It was a sort of one stepping stone leading to another and that's basically how my whole life has gone. Yeah. Um, and as you say, I'd simply find it far more interesting. Like, as Chris was saying, like the process of photography is, is fascinating and enjoyable and engrossing and immersing in itself. But when I step back from that, I simply find it more interesting. And particularly as time goes by and the state of the world becomes more and more clear. And we're, we, you know, if we have the chance to be able to do something to, to shift the world in a better direction than the way the, the one that it's going in, um, to me, that just that that urge becomes more and more compelling. Mm. Going back to Peter, though, um, with the hindsight or with the distance of time, and it was reasonably clear even when he was alive. But um, Peter changed the way 
Tasmanians view themselves. He changed the identity of Tasmania in such an incredibly profound way. Because I know people who grew up in Tasmania. I don't think any of us here, apart from you, Simon, and this is you know, going back probably before you were that old. But everyone else is a ring in from the mainland. No, 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 not me. No, no, sorry, no, 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 no I'm, I'm original. Uh, you're, you're a young un. You're a young un, so you don't count. <laughs> but I talk to people of my own age who grew up here, and Tasmania was a very different place. It was cold. It was backward. It was, you know. You know, a lot of the characteristics have still carried through, but, you know, education levels were low. Um, there was a lot of, you know, low-skilled, low-paid labour. We were sort of all, all the, Tas you know, Tasmanian. Tasmania itself wasn't aware of what an extraordinary place that it is. And we, we've become more aware, and that's fleshed out in so many spheres. But the core brand of Tasmania is its natural beauty. Mm. And Peter, even more so than Lagos, I mean, because the Lagos was more pitched towards specific places, perhaps, in the, the Peter campaign. Um, but I guess because Peter was such a, a quantum leap in terms of the quality of his, of his imagery, all of a sudden, Tasmania, for Tasmanians, and probably even more so for people who weren't in Tasmania, became this alluring, beautiful, beautiful, naturally-based island. And I yeah. think that's... You know, Peter created brand Tasmania. It's, it's a crass thing to say, but he was profoundly influential in shifting Tasmania in that direction. Like if he hadn't been around, maybe it would have, you know, probably would have crept up incrementally um, from other photographers or other people. But he was, because his work was such a quantum leap, it happened in a very dramatic way. Mm. Mm, that's a that's a, a really good point. And, and yes, having grown up here, I... I know exactly what you mean about um, the you know, Tasmanians not knowing what they have, um, and certainly they are much more aware of it now. But there's still a lot of an element that that that, that don't know what they have, and I guess you know um, um, familiarity breeds contempt or, or similar. It's probably not the right term for it because they're not that familiar with some of our wilderness areas um, as it is, and it, it's. It's certainly frustrating for me um, because I, I think that everyone should see what we've got here and that everyone should be wanting to make sure that it's not destroyed and, 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 um, and plundered and, and, uh, and buggered. And I, 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 that's a frustrating element that I don't think we'll ever fully fix. But, but you're right, Peter would have switched a lot of people um, out of that drudgery of their own perception of what Tasmania is and made them realise that we do have something extraordinarily beautiful here. And that is a, an, incredible, an incredible legacy. I, I mean, as, um, as the oldest Tasmanian here... <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, having lived here through the period that uh, Rob's just been talking about, I'd have to take serious issue with some of the, his characterisation, and that's a subject for perhaps another night. Um, and yes, I mean, there's a greater appreciation of you know, what the values of natural Tasmania now, and yes, obviously Peter is part of that. I'm not sure I'd go so far as Rob to say that he's responsible for brand Tasmania. But I don't necessarily think we're in a better place now. We just have a new commodity to be exploited, basically, yeah. um, and uh, and we've got to keep you know, arguing against that, um, arguing the, the other perspective, the one that Peter would have argued, I imagine, that uh, it's not just another way to make money. Yeah, that that's that's absolutely true, um, Grant, and and I've heard. Um, I've heard the argument from people before that um, that that, that, um, that one of Peter's legacies, I guess, is increasing our tourism to the point now where we don't want so many tourists because they're trampling things that they shouldn't be trampling, and and I find that a very uh, quite a hollow and, and 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 difficult argument for them to argue, but uh, but I, I guess if you were to think of um, something that I guess it's true to some extent, and um, I know Grant yourself. You've you've done plenty of studies in relation to 
uh, track condition in the Western Arthurs and, and other bits of Southwest Tasmania. And, and I, I remember looking at this particular matter and um, looking at the photographs like Blake Oberon when that was produced and the visitation numbers following when that was released. And there seems to be a jump in the numbers visiting that area in that time. Is that your understanding? I know you basically produced that report that I'm talking about. Uh, well, in fact, the jump in numbers that you're talking about, essentially we're talking about you know, people, areas being loved to death, which mm. usually starts with um, a, a place being um, a, a nice photo of a place achieving um, cult status, iconic status, if you like, which, of course, the modern digital platforms um, really allow for. Um, and Lake Oberon, which, uh, as you're talking about, is, is certainly one of them. So, yes, even more so these days. That's mm. a management problem now. But, uh, but I guess the, uh, the message really that we need to take from this is that um, illustrating, I mean, taking the, capturing the images and putting them out there uh, illustrates in our, we're illustrating what we think is a special place, but you need to have, there's another part to the argument. It's not just about its prettiness, it's about all its other special qualities and whether the photographer is the, uh, the advocate of that or whether there are other people out there advocating for it, um, doesn't matter. But um, uh, otherwise, you know, it's just, it just gets co-opted as another resource, like I was talking about before. It's a little mm. rambling a bit here, but hopefully the message is getting across. No, no, loud and clear, loud and clear. And, um, and it's, a, what, what do you think, well, it's probably fairly obvious, but what do you think Peter's messaging would be in this day and age attached to his images. I mean, I, I imagine he would be would take the view that, um, I mean, I, I don't know what view he would take exactly, but I imagine that he would see the issues that we're having with, with loving places to death in the internet age and, and he would want to attach a conservation or a, uh, a, a message to his photographs that this is a beautiful place but we have to look after it and, and um, we, we, we can't love it to death. Yeah. yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm making the point of, but... Um, uh, well, my, my I mean, I, is that, I, how, how do you think Peter would have evolved in modern time with, with, as issues have evolved? Uh, it's not a question we can really answer, but, you know, having, having, you know, starting to move into position of influence at that level, I wonder, where, I wonder how he would have used that position in, in more modern times. And how he would have adapted and evolved to the to the issues that we currently have. Yeah, certainly. Know, anyone... yeah, yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, I was just going to say that certainly the assaults that we're starting to see now weren't really around. I mean, it was incremental, of course, but they weren't really around when Peter was still alive. And um, I'm sure he'd be horrified now to know that possibly, uh, you know, there's a, a it's a photography is a two-edged sword and that we are all responsible in some respects to for the damage or, or, or the horrible situation that we're in where you know it is a commodity now and 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 we're not treating these places as they should be treated uh, but you know he died in 1996 and uh we weren't really seeing the absolute assault on 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 our parts uh that we're seeing now so so a, a lot's changed in that time yeah. Well, to me, that, that's a bit of a lead in to maybe get Simon a bit more involved in the conversation in that how do we feel Peter's work now sits in terms of its influence on the future? Like how, how is it going to sort of have its place? And, and I know Simon's very involved in, in you know, reproducing the, the highest quality of work that we, that we, that we can possibly have of, of Peter's work and, and he's one of the few people in the world that, that now have access to it from a futuristic point of view. Simon, do you have a thought about how you feel like that role that you've taken on, uh, how you feel about it yourself and, and what it represents and, and where you see it getting in terms of how people will be able to access Peter's work in the future and, and how it will maintain its influence? Um, that's a very long question, Paul. <laughs> um, he's good at that. Uh, he's good at that. Sorry, mate. <laughs> Um, look, I, I, I guess um, you know, I've been very lucky to be able to work with um, you know, the, the archive of Peter's work. Um, 
and I guess what I would say about his work in terms of its its influence on you know past photographers and future photographers is that you know good composition doesn't go out of style, and uh, and that's the strength of his work to me. Um, and so I think it'll be a you know it'll be a it'll be a lesson for for all you know budding wilderness photographers or any any type of photographer really. Um, we'd like to see his work you know continue to be to be accessible and I'll talk a little bit about about you know where it is now and and um, what sort of current publishing is taking place with it um, but yeah like I think his um, work is you know, extremely influential um, still and and you know it's ex still extremely popular like there's, there's still quite a lot of demand for it and you know we'd we'd like to try to use that um, the power of his imagery to help push a conservation message forward. Um, and I'll, I can talk a little bit about that um, as we go forward too. But the, the, there's an idea brewing where we might be able to actually build a an environmental photography trust uh, based potentially around Peter's work that that we can use to. Um, help raise some funds for, for conservation projects. And that's in discussion with, with Liz and um, some other people in the conservation movement. Um, and, you know, that'd be a, that'd be a lovely lasting legacy if we could push that, push that forward so that, you know, even though Peter may not have been a, a strong verbal advocate for the environment in his day, as I understand, um, you know, he was certainly at his heart a conservationist and gave his, imagery to conservation causes um, for, for use. And the classic one is, of course, the Rock Island Bend image. Um, so it'd be, yeah, it'd be lovely if we could complete that circle and, and bring those images back into that, that sort of conservation arena again. Yeah, great. Uh, well, we might continue on then, Simon, with your, your work um, and your remastering of Peter's work. Um, so if you wanted to um, uh, start talking about that and, and and how that all came about and and uh, and the, the transparencies of Peters themselves and where yeah. they are and, and et cetera, et cetera. That'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, so I, I sort of got to know Liz uh, probably 10 or 12 years ago, I suppose. And um, at the time I was sort of doing a little bit of consulting around, you know, computing and colour management and those sort of things. And she was starting to scan a bunch of Peters transparencies as, as small images um, because she was planning to give the whole collection to the National Library uh, of Australia, um, which is where they now reside. So she donated the whole um, physical collection. So all the original transparencies all uh, reside in Canberra um, and they're all in cold storage, um, which is you know, probably the right place for them to be um, because they'll be properly looked after. Um, and she's still living in Ferntree and it's a fire prone area and it would have been you know, a tragedy to lose Peter's collection as well as Alagus's collection mm -hmm. you know, in similar circumstances. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's undoubtedly the right place for it to be. So as, as part of that um, process, then they digitised, the National Library uh, digitised those images. Um, and they currently have, I think it's around about 3,000 uh, images. And it's going back to some of the early stuff as well, the six by six um images that Grant was showing of the shop tower and Richmond and all those sorts of things. Um, but the vast majority is the, is the four by five inch transparency collection. Yeah. yeah. Are you aware um, if any um, haven't been digitized? Are they still there? Um, I'm not aware of that. I mean, I, I don't know if they digitized everything. I, I think it was a, I think Liz went through a selection process at the time to, um, uh, to, to choose, but it would have been based on Know, essentially all the things are kept. Um, um, I'm sort of aware, and Chris can probably you know, corroborate this, but I think after Peter had his um, his first operation on his heart uh, and he was in a bit of a depression after that, is it right, Chris, to say that, that I think Liz found him throwing flicking transparencies into the fire at home <laughs> one day? Yeah, probably because he was realistic and realised that some of the stuff needed to be yeah, been like so, we all do. So maybe he was, maybe he was being dramatic and just throwing out the, the duds. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a good story anyway. Um, uh, well, it's in the it's in the, the documentary Wildness, so it's yeah. actually quite a well-known um, anecdote, I suppose, that Liz has given us. And um, 
you know, I um, I was <laughs> clear up this myth for me, Simon, if, if it is indeed a myth. I was under the impression that one of the transparencies was a Rock Island Bend transparency and that there are actually two uh, images of Rock Island Bend that were taken um, seconds apart um, and one of those no longer exists and that might be the one that's on the posters and that the one you've got now is different to the ones that was on the posters. Can you talk yeah. about that? Um, look, I haven't got the full story. I was under the understanding that it was one of the ones that, that ended up in the fire. Mm. But, like, yeah, I can't speak the full truth mm. of, of that mm. one. Yeah. Do you know um, Chris at all? No, no, I can't. Mm. Uh, that, that's mm. what I heard. And I, 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 I think I did look into it one day when I actually started looking at your mm. reproduction and the original ones, and I think I might have seen that there was some slightly different swirls in the foam. Yeah, I have, a, I have a funny feeling the one the library's got is a dupe, actually, but I'm, mm, I'm, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm not 100% mm. uh, so, right. sure of that. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Anyway, it's an interesting interesting yeah. Yeah. anecdote um, that um, that he felt that the, that he was to do that. But, uh, you, Chris, you might be right, he just... Got a couple of duds out and chucked them in. <laughs> but, um, I, think, I think it's it's possible that Peter just digitally retouched the phone, looked like the squirrels. <laughs> <right. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as as Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, yeah. So so we some years ago, I, I um, approached Liz and just you know once I learned that she was doing this um, this project. Um, and just talked about maybe it, it's a shame that they're all just going to disappear into the library. She'd stop publishing the calendars and diaries, um, and I was just a little bit worried that it was all just going to disappear into into obscurity to some degree, and it'd be nice for people still to be able to have access to them. So we sat down and we chose about 50 um, original images, um, and we, she acquired this, the high-res scans that the National Library had produced, um, and, and then I started working on them from there. So over, I don't know, 10 years, we've probably redone around about 50 images, um, which doesn't sound like very many, um, but I might just I might just share my screen for a second and, and um, show you uh, some of the ones that we've got um, and, and where we were starting with. Um, so just here, for example, can people see that website there? Yeah. Yep. So that's the National Library Trove uh, website um, and you can actually see you can search for Dombrowski's work in there um, and you'll actually see these are the, the scans that they've actually produced um, now it seems that there's and I've, I've had you know corroborated reports on this that a, an error was made when they decided to digitize these and, and effectively a bunch of these in fact almost all of them are about two stops underexposed in the scanning process um, so even if we pull up something like, um, you know, this um, one of uh, quartzite um, in the Franklin River, I think, um, you know, you'll see it's really, really quite, quite dark. Um, and one of the really the things that we used to love about Peter's work and the, and the reproductions of it was they were really luminous. They were open, yeah. beautiful open shadows, and you know, partly that's possibly the drum scanning process I used back at the at the time. Sure. Um, but the issue we've sort of had a bit really with these is um, I'll just go to another in here. Just just on that point, as you're as you're about to make that point, Simon. Uh, just for people studying Peter in the future, etc. Um, if you do go to Trove, as as um, Simon has said, um, the images are generally quite dark. They weren't intended that way, and again. It's worth referring back to the original, the, uh, the, the books um, from, um, particularly from Wild Rivers through to Simply, uh, to get an idea of how um, Peter's work was probably, um, I mean, Wild Rivers was the only book he produced apart from Quiet Land um, with Rod Poole. Um, uh, he, Rod Poole didn't do Quiet Land, but it was the only one that was produced with Rod Poole while Peter was alive. Um, and Rod took that with the productions after Peter's death uh, in the knowledge of how Peter had produced his calendars, et cetera, et cetera. And so 
in my mind and probably in, in others, um, they are the, the, the ones that are in the books and the calendars are how Peter saw or would have wanted his images represented mm. and what you currently see digitally if you go into the raw transparencies on Trove are not representations of how Peter would have wanted them. And I'll just quickly make the point, because we haven't yet, um, that the most recent book, which was published in 2017, and there have been um, a number of editions, it was, it was quite cheaply produced and was only $40 brand new, which was less than half than how much Peter's books sold for um, brand new uh, earlier on, um, that those images, it's my understanding, were worked from the transparencies, uh, sorry, from the scans of the transparencies, and there was some interpretation of those or, or work that had to be done on those. And the interpretation isn't the same in those in many cases as you'll get in the original, uh, in the other books. So it's worth just comparing that book, which is very accessible, but please go back to the older books and have a look at those. And you might get a different sense for how the work is um, how the work looks and you can make your own judgment as to what Peter might have been um, more happy with, I suppose. And that's, that's all I'll say on that, but it was a point from... The, the, the images in the 2017 book were from scan, the scans, the underexposed scans. So well, they, yeah, so we're all, we're all working from the same scan. So the, yeah. the, the, you know, the production plates for the book were made from these and they were produced um I, I think it's possibly more i don't know for sure but i think it's probably the, the project was sent offshore you know to a print broker and um yeah it was just a bit of an ordinary job really so you know there's there's images in the book there i've got a copy of the book um you know and it's got a nice misty image like this one on the right here and the mist is bright purple you know and uh, i'm pretty sure it wasn't you know a, a nice uh, purple morning yes. um so yeah. yeah, I think it was. I think it was production values. Really, was the, the issue. Yeah. And yes. um, so what we've tried to do, and it's interesting you talk about the books, Nick, because because when I started working on these, and and you can see there's a big difference between these two images. The one on the right is the one that we use as a master print file. Um, you know, it'll look different on all of your screens, no doubt. But um, you know, it but it's a it's a pretty reasonable representation, and the way I worked out. You know what they should look like really was to actually go back to the books that, um, that Rod produced and use that as a bit of a reference. Mm. Um, you know, you, you've got to understand that any book production is going to, in the course of a print run, is going to have variation in it mm. as well. Yeah. Um, some of those books, you know, those plates may have faded a bit, or you know, so there's a little bit of so I use it as a bit of a basis, and then you know, I guess because we've all sort of grown up in this landscape here, we sort of know what our natural colours. In our landscape are as well so there's a little we know what we know what our our green mosses are and you know the, the lichens on the on the myrtles and you know, we, we sort of had an innate understanding of pretty much what they are um so a combination of you know that knowing what it probably should be and referencing some of the books um and and referencing a few different you know versions of publications is is how we tried to come up with what it would we think it should look like yeah. um you know, one of the things with, I guess, publishing things these or, or processing digital images these days is, is we have the opportunity to do so much. Um, and one of the tricks with this really was to not do too much at all. And in, in fact, to, to resist that urge to, to push things, you know, like, like we might be tempted to a bit um, with our digital imagery um, and just to, to pull back and try and respect what we thought the original values of the work were, and again, that's going back and looking at those those um, publications, and 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 also talking with Liz. You know, every every time I'd do a new master, I'd run it by Liz and say, you know, what do you think? Um, you know, and she said no. We'd we'd go back and and do a bit more. Mm. So so we're lucky at the moment that we have people around us like Chris and like Liz and Bob Brown and Rob um, that we have access to that really important you know, body of, of, of knowledge, um, not only of Peter's work, but but of the environment that, that he was working in. Um, so we've got a really good opportunity to actually make 
you know, a fantastic collection that we can use going forward. And, uh, you know, my, my fear, I guess, with the way the National Library stuff is at the moment is, is you know, the, the current arrangement is, is, is when Liz passes away, copyright reverts to the library. Um, and then, you know, I'd hate to see the image on the left if somebody made a request for this image, I'd hate to see that image on the left go out into wow. the world as a representation of, of what this image was supposed to be. Because yep. I don't think it is. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, so it's been a wonderful sort of project and it's an ongoing project. And um, as I say, the images are extremely popular. Um, we sell them through our website. Rob sells them through the Wild Island um, Gallery website in, in um, Salamanca as well. Um, and I, I don't know, Rob, but you'd probably say it's probably the most um, popular photo sort of category in your in your gallery down there. We get regular orders sort of weekly for Dombrovskis work. So, like I say, you know, a great composition like this will never go out of out of style. Um, and and people relate to his work. It's it's a wonderful thing. Mm. Oh, I mean, is it? Um, I don't know if it's a silly question, but is it possible to ever um, rescan them now that we've got better technology uh, and all of that? Kind I of thing? should say that because we're actually having that discussion with the National Library as well. Um, so the the two discussions we're having is around, you know, potential access after that copyright arrangement, you know, copyright arrangement changes, um, and you know the the inherent flaws in in the, the body of work that's that's scanned and you know, it's a big ask to ask them to take everything out of cold storage and go back and rescan 3000 transparencies because i'm sure they've got a lot of other things to do um but you know that's it's a really important collection and i do acknowledge that it's one of the jewels in their photographic collection in the national library um and i do respect it um so it's a bit of a delicate negotiation at the moment as to as to you know where we can go with that yeah so, so i'm going to question here uh is the National Library aware of the inadequacies of the original scans and they realise that these are dark? Um, and that you're they are, working... it's, it's been brought to their attention. I, I was in Canberra for something else a couple of years ago, so I actually met with the um, curator there. Okay. And, and I did bring up issues exactly this, what we're looking at with these two images and saying, you know, it would be terrible for this to go out as a representative um, example. Um, so they are aware of it, and in, in some of the discussions we've had recently with them, um, that's been brought up. Um, yeah, but I, I don't want to go, I don't want to talk too much about it at the moment because sure. we are sort of, yeah. you know, talking about it with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to uh, show us, Simon, um, how much work you had to do or what, what the, the issues um, were with, with remastering and how you went about yeah, it? I guess um, you know that this this brightness difference is the you know one of the the, the big things and the, and the real issue is these really dark heavy shadows. Um, so you know I'm not going to go into the actual processing of, of stuff, no. um, but needless to say, just involves lots of masks and and um, you know channels and all sorts of bits and pieces to try and pull stuff out. Um, the other thing about these transparencies, I don't know if this is a great example um is that they are filthy as well um that's not too bad I'll, I'll show you another one which is much worse um so this is the original transparency and actually i might ask chris to talk about this one in a second um but this is mount hayes in the western arthurs um and you know it's obviously it's been in and out of sleeves and in and out of scanners and things over the years um Wow, but enough. the scratches. Uh... Either just you know, and um, of all the ones I did, I think this one probably took the longest. So there's probably about ten or twenty hours worth mm. of just spotting stuff, <laughs> you know, and and it's all the way down through the cliffs and, oh, and wow. else as well. So you know, and there's you know, there's probably little bits of mould in there. Um, some of the Mount Anne ones are, are, are really mouldy. Um, so, and we, and we do pretty big prints. We do, you know, meter high prints of these. So this sort of stuff's going to show up. So, you know, some of it's just, like I say, lots of masking or whatever, and some of it's just time. <laughs> it's just you know, <laughs> huge amounts of time. And, and, and that's why I've probably only done 50 of them, you know, because... Because uh, you've got you know, a business to run and everything you've got a business else to run, well. exactly. And when they all look like that, you know, it's, um, it's a bit of a job. Um, but, it, you know, you know, they talk about a labour of love, I suppose. And, and to me, that's what this is. Um, 
Because, and just going back to, you know, influence um, and being influenced, you know, I grew up here. Um, I grew up in a bushwalking family and we're out all the time. And I just grew up with these wilderness calendars plastered all over my bedroom wall. Mm. Um, you know, it was, it was fully um, influential in me leave, you know, leaving the States. But it's funny you say about growing up here because when I was young, everyone wanted to get out. So I went to Melbourne. So I was in Melbourne for 12 years and um, did my photography training and, and um, worked over there in, in the university photography sector for, for 10 years. Um, but I always knew I was coming home. And, and this is probably why, I would say. It's mm. a huge part um, of why I came home. Yeah. And it really wasn't long after I got back in 2000 that I actually connected with with both Rob and Chris. You know, just just went to a talk Chris was giving and had a chat to him afterwards, and you know that was the beginning of that. And we've been friends for 20 20 years now, yeah. um, and similarly with Rob. Um, so yeah, hugely influential on my on my um, professional career. Yeah. It's and it's a wonderful thing that you've you've basically taken on this this task of of remastering these images um it's just fantastic and um yeah you've got quite a few there i think we should um, probably start flicking through them as yeah, we're talking definitely. um talking yeah. side of it. but um just just the point you just or just the, the thing you said before uh, you might get chris to talk again uh, or talk about that mount hayes image um yeah okay i know it's a i know it's a, a sad topic um but I think for the, the purpose of education, it would be, um, if you don't mind talking about it, Chris, talk about um, um, the search for Peter and, and, and what, what went on and, and et cetera. I think people would be interested to hear. And this was obviously Mount Hayes. This image was um, one of his very, very last images from his very last trip. So it um, yeah. has a special meaning. But, Chris, if you want to talk to it, mate. Uh, yes, yeah, just briefly. Uh, first of all, I know that spot particularly well. It's a, it's a great little wonderful alpine moor, as you can see there. It's just one of those one of those lovely spots you find in the Western Arthur, with a little stream going across it. And, mm. um, and when we were looking for Peter, I... There were helicopters going out, left, right and centre, and uh, it sounds absurd to say this now, but I wasn't worried about him at all. I, I thought, oh, obviously, he's, he's over there, so he's probably fallen over and broken an arm or something. And uh, Because I just had this idiotic, childish notion in my head that famous people don't die, and of course they do. <laughs> um, and it was a pretty shattering... Uh, call that came over the radio when they finally found him. So it was it was terrible. And I remember when Liz had this Peter's graphmatics in her hand and uh, she was very emotional and shaking and she was almost putting her fingers on the on the sep on the the plate that separates the, the septum. But I said, Liz, don't touch it. <laughs> Otherwise you'll you might finish up exposing a whole lot of her. And uh, so um, so yeah that was one of the very last ones he he took. Uh, you know fantastic part of Tasmania so. yeah so you so obviously um, it's it's briefly explained in the the documentary wildness as well but but he didn't he didn't come to the um, he didn't come home or to back to the meeting point where he's supposed to be and then that sparked the search and you you went out yourself on foot uh, no I was for so? some reason the uh, police Want to be back at the at the camp so we could uh, every now and again fly out to different areas, um, and they insisted on going to places that I knew Peter wouldn't be at, and and this particular policeman at the time said, no no we've got to check out everything, and uh, I thought it was a bit crazy because I knew that Peter wouldn't have been there, but yeah. uh, but for some reason he held me back and I was back at this base <laughs> and the other people were out in the field looking for him and. Uh, yeah. yeah, and Nick, um, there there are, there were four photographers that I can remember that were involved in the search. Yep. Um, Jeff Lee, I think, was there with Chris, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, and Ted Mead and I were out in the field. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And and the weather was pretty bad, so there wasn't a lot of helicopter flying during some mm -hmm. of the time. So there, there was a bit of you know, he he was eventually found by a ground party, mm -hmm. um, not uh, not by flying around in helicopters that came in from different directions. 
Um, I think I think on the second day of the search from memory, but I can't remember how long the search was, how long after he was reported out, you know, how long he'd been out for before the search started, a few days anyway. Mm. Mm. But was he was he out of the field or was he in camp or no, no, he was found on the back of Mount Hayes, the mountain in that photograph, um, basically collapsed on the track. And I think the autopsy concluded that he basically just had a massive heart attack and it was all over. I think he was actually, well, I heard the story that he was actually found kneeling. Uh, the first sight of him, he, he just, he was kneeling with his pack still on, on, you know, just next to the track. So he'd obviously had the massive heart attack and just slumped mm. to his knees. Yeah. I was actually also searching further down the range uh, with Martin Hawes and um, I met all three or, four, three or four of us, a couple of police and Martin and I, and I think some, another person who I can't remember. And my recollection is that everyone else was staying, staying in this little cave sort of halfway up the track and I really didn't want to stay in the cave so I went up and just pitched a tent on a little flat a bit yeah. which meters up the hill and Martin brought the news up to me and he came up and said it, it's no good mate he's gone and for both of us it was this sense and it, it's just you know the weather that Grant described just receded and we were both silent there for, for some minutes just thinking about it and you know, <laughs> this terrible weather that was raging all around us just went into the background. Yeah, and what are, what are your memories, all of you, I suppose, um, of of the the reaction once you got back to civilization, the, the reaction of the the general public and and and, and people around uh, to to his death. Well, I, I suppose there was just a lot of disbelief and uh, by people that knew him and uh, it was just, I guess, the end of an era and I guess it's the simplest way to describe it, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess so. It's, it's Again, there's, there's footage of Peter's um, funeral, um, uh, which was um, conducted on the mountain, if I'm not mistaken, in... In terrible weather as well, um, which I'm, I'm sure Peter wouldn't have minded. But um, it just, um, just it. it um, I don't know how to put it. Um, I was only very young. I was only sixteen, and I didn't know much about Peter at all at that stage. Um, but I remember reading about it, and I remember seeing it on the news, and, and thinking. Gee, he must have been a pretty good photographer with all these people talking about him. Um, and I think it was probably my first conscious memory of him. And then I found out that all these pictures that I was seeing in in um, uh, national park visitor centres and and at the schools on posters and everything was this man that that, that had just died. And um, yeah, I remember I remember pausing and thinking about the the, the grief that I was seeing and thinking, just this must have been such a a wonderful man. Um, yeah, you know, I, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense for how what the public reaction was. Did, did you get that at all? I mean, Rob or Grant, did you see any of that? Uh, well, I, I can't remember. Literally, I mean, I mean, obviously, everyone has their own personal reactions. And I went to the funeral that you mentioned and uh, as did most of us who were here. Um, and it was a pretty bleak day, but there were lots of people there. But in, I imagine there was stuff in the media, but I just don't remember any of that. It's, mm. it's all just talking about what a loss it was amongst the, you know, the, the group of fellow greenies and photographers, basically. That was the extent of my memory. Chris? Yeah. I yeah, I'm not sure I can add much to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There, there was certainly a lot of press uh, coverage of it. I've got heaps of clippings at home of, of uh, all the papers and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was it was certainly out there. Yeah. How, how would you describe the, the sort of energy and feeling at the funeral? I know you spoke there, Chris, is my understanding. You know, it was, it was pretty hard, uh, Paul. Um, in fact, uh, uh, somebody else asked me to MC the whole thing and I just really wasn't in, a, in that uh, frame of mind that I could accomplish something like that. So uh, I just wrote something and uh, read that out. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Sorry, Rob, you were about to say something. I was going to say, I mean, Peter didn't, he wasn't a very public figure. Like no. as we were saying before, Chris was saying before, he was a very quiet person. Like, unlike Alagus, who gave those big you know, town hall presentations and so on. I don't recall Peter ever doing anything like that. Like he had a couple of exhibitions, but even then he was just, you know, it was very low key. Mm. And his fame was amongst the people who knew and appreciated his work mm. and bushwalkers and people who bought calendars and so on. Rather, I mean, few people would have recognised him in the street, I suspect. Mm. Mm. And, I, and I guess that that fame has grown. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pro probably trying to elicit more out of you guys than, than you've, you've, <laughs> you've got, I suppose. But um, I guess for, for my, my generation and, and the generation coming, he's, um, he's a mythical figure, um, a, a legendary figure. Um, he wasn't a, he wasn't, you know, I'm not talking like a Superman sort of figure, but, but, yeah, you know, I didn't know him. People haven't met him that are greatly influenced by him. Um, and I guess, I guess the more time goes on, the more that um, myth or legend grows, I suppose. And and um, it's interesting listening to you guys talking tonight about um, about your own personal um, recollections of Peter, and, and and they're far more down to earth. Than my own thoughts and feelings because I didn't know him and now he's that mythical figure. Do you see what I'm getting at there? I, I, I guess Nick, Luke, you might relate to that. I'll make one comment to that, Nick, to, yeah. that really acknowledges that beyond our own personal kind of feeling around his his fame. Is is my understanding? He is the only Australian photographer in the history of the world to to be inducted into the International Hall of Fame. Yeah. So that's not just a personal anecdote, that's a global one. Mm. Um, and that really puts them in a position that no other photographer in this country has, has found themselves, is, is my understanding. So so I guess... Oh, Simon, do you want to just keep scrolling through images as yeah, Paul's sure. talking? Yeah. Sorry, we'll just continue looking at images as we go. Well, that Sorry, Paul. Point, I guess what, what, what is it of all the influential photographers in Australian history that, that Peter's the only one that, that has made it in those halls? Yeah, that's your answer right there. Yeah, well, that's, that's my favourite image of his. <laughs> that's, I think, that's my favourite. That's definitely my favourite image, and I know Luke enjoys that one mm. as well. And, um, the, and the image before, of course, was Morning Mist at Rock Island Bend, um, which is the the most iconic landscape image ever produced in Australia um, for great reason, and and a large part of his legacy is in that picture from um, from a, a general sense I suppose um, but um, but there was so much more and there is so much more and um, Chris do you know how Peter himself felt about the rock Island Bend photograph like did he even see it as one of his quite honestly I don't think he did uh, to be absolutely frank with it Paul I think yeah, that was uh, my thought. certainly his tree the following tree picture he was uh, pretty fond of, and I remember him coming back and showing it to me, and uh, and and me thinking, yeah, this is a pretty amazing myrtle. <laughs> and so, yeah, but I, I I don't. I mean, I never talked about Rock Island Ben with him, but um, I, I don't think he thought it was one of his better images. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's interesting. Uh, Richard Flanagan talks about that too in the documentary that um, uh, that personally for. Richard, um, it's not one of his favourite images because he's been there many times and it just mm. speak to him the same way. But it's yeah, I just thought I'd throw that throw that mm. in. It's a, an interesting point. Yeah. So these these images are of Mount Wellington. I think actually I'm not sure about this one. Um, this is definitely that's off uh, yeah. off Mount Wellington. Like it could be <clears throat> could be in the amphitheater that that um Waratah one. Yeah, I, I think it's in on the mountain. So you yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just as we're going through the images, gentlemen, I, I, there's an invitation to follow through the end of the show with 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 uh, anyone who wants to speak to a particular image that has influenced them, or they feel really they they want to speak to. One thing I wanted to mention, or 
I find interesting about his work is that um, the, there's very uh, close compositions, especially in the sky, um, and mm. there, there tends to be not much sky, and you see a lot of the way that the shots are taken these days, there's quite a lot, even a third of the image being sky. Does anyone have any sort of thoughts on, on why that might be? I think I think this one here is is a bit like I was talking about before. It's that's that sweeping foreground. Yeah. And once you start pointing your camera at the ground, you haven't got a lot of room for sky. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So, so it's a fairly simple equation. <laughs> yeah. But also, it's it's probably also the most in, uninteresting part of yep. of a composition if there's nothing yep. really going on in the sky, yep. and quite often there isn't. And uh, you do see people including vast tracts of sky when you think, gee. Um, not much. I should have there. left a little bit of that out. <laughs> and 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 the focus uh, on the sky. I've I've talked about this in a, a talk I gave a, a, a few years back. But the, there's there's almost in landscape photography these days. Um, and look, it's very general what I'm saying. It's not a rule. It's not. It's just an observation that there there's a lot of emphasis, particularly with people learning that that it's the the sky and the sunset and the pinks and the oranges and stuff that make make a, a good photograph. And I, I think it's probably for anyone watching that's getting into it that that you'll notice that none of these images that you're looking at have mm. pretty skies. Yeah. They, there is almost no colour in any of the skies in any of Peter's photographs. And in fact, I can only remember one or two and one of them is a silhouette of some dollarite columns mm. um, taken at sunrise on... Canani Mount Wellington, um, which is in on the mountain, um, and other than that, there's almost none. I think there, there may be one or two, but if you look, start looking through the trove collection to see the the real volume of it, it's it's the same trend. Um, Peter um, was focused on the land and the subjects in there, and the sky held no interest for him. And I think if you are a photographer that's interested in wilderness photography, um, and it brings back to that stuff we were talking about detail earlier, that, that, that to, to concentrate on, on those details and you'll find yourself drawn away from those skies. It's not to say you can't get a nice picture with a beautiful sky. Of course you can. But there's more to landscape photography than, than pretty colours in the sky. That's right. Um, I think... I think um, so I was going to say, I think this image, you know, when I when I think back to the to books and you think of that title of that book, The Quiet Land, yeah. you know, I think an image like this is is, is that title, you know, personified in a way. Yeah. And and when I always thought of his work, I always thought of this beautiful, soft wrapping lighting. And you know, apart from some of those, um, one thing he did do really beautifully was was backlit work. So there's all that really lovely backlit yeah. um, stuff in the Western Arthurs. Yeah. But principally, when I think of his work, and there's quite a lot of it in here, um, it's this lovely, soft wrapping, mm. you know, quiet land light. And that's, yeah. that's how I see yeah. a lot of his work. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Simon just answered my own question, but I felt like part of that sky kind of element is, is he wasn't shooting in light that was often that was going for that, you know, powerful, dramatic, um, directional lighting. He often chose very subdued. Uh, very subtle uh, palettes of, of light and, and very wrapping light, like Simon said. And as I'm saying this, just two we were just a little bit opposite to that, but yeah. it, it, <laughs> it stood out to me as a, a quality of his work. And there was some sort of luminosity to his work that I still astounds me that his understanding of light has just went beyond what, what still most people are capable of comprehending and, and capturing today, at least with that level of consistency. Mm. Do you think there's an aspect to where the, you know, the film itself didn't allow for enough like, dynamic range to be yeah. able to capture those really bright, um, you know, bright sky, but, you know, dim foreground and, and trying to make that work in a, in a film shot. Um, that's, that's probably true. If you, if you think back to that Walls of Jerusalem one um, way back there, which has got the, you know, the, the green cushion plant in the foreground, yeah. um, that's probably exactly what's going on there. It's, it's probably, you know, there might've been a bit of blue or a bit of, tone or a bit of cloud in the sky there but you're probably actually just you know choosing to crop out that sky because you know you can't hold it yeah. much as well, well, the other that? factor is, right there. Yeah, there you go. the other factor is that peter didn't have um, the benefit of the software that can bring out the full dynamic range of 
you know, what the image holds. So his five by four is scanned today and processed with, you know, software as Simon can do, um, can bring out way much more, way, way more, you know, detail in the, mm -hmm. the shadows and the highlights than Peter would have ever seen in his life. Like Simon, you've done, um, I'm thinking of that um, Mount Hayes shot, when it appears in one of Peter's books, um, or, you know, one of Rod Poole, and yeah, I guess it was after his death, so it would have been one of Rod Poole's books. Um, there's ba basically no detail on the sky, but your print of it, Simon, you can see blue, you can see the clouds, the detail is there. Mm. Mm. Good point, Rob. Yeah, but some of that's probably um, stuff that you might lose on the press. I'm not an expert on uh, printing, but, you know, dot gain's an issue and... and um, you know, you may just not be able to hold those those highlight dots on a, on a um, image yeah, like more, that. Yeah, more Simon, or is this at the end? Oh, um, well, I don't know. Well, I think I've got all of our collection here. Um, so this would have been one of the ones from um, the Macquarie Island trip mm -hmm. that uh, Chris did. With is that the shot you were referring to, Nick, was it earlier? No, not that. Oh, okay. But, yeah, look, I love that one. It's a more yeah. detailed shot. It's not kelp itself. It's that bobbly stuff. Oh, and I uh, love that. I uh, love that um, Douglas exactly, yeah. shot. That's in fact that's uh, that's one. It's one of the ones that really struck me personally early on, um, seeing it and recognizing it and finding out who'd shot it um, really early on. Um, it, I, I had this poster on my wall for years. Yeah, yeah. It was rip, it was it was made into lots of posters actually, um, and and that's what I remember it from. It struck me straight away that. Um, that um, the greenness of the water was just something I hadn't seen before and it was really quite special. Hmm. So this, this is one of the ones that's totally covered in mould and scratches and it's another it's another 10-hour job, that one. <laughs> yeah, gee. Um, just on the tonal range, um, I just I, I read this quote some time ago, but I've just found it again. Peter remarked, uh, the things you see cannot always be recorded on film because of the tonal range of the scene. The difference between the lightest and the darkest parts exceeds the ability of the film to record it. You've just got to accept that, he said. So I guess that was his, his point. He just accepted it and, um, and shot what, he, what did fit within his, the realms of the film's dynamic range. It, I always think of it interesting to think what he'd do now, um, mm. you know, because... You know, I guess Chris is a very good example of, you know, adopting the best technology available at the time. So Chris, when, when 4.5 was the best, that's what Chris was shooting, and now he's on to 100 megapixel Fujis. You know, <laughs> what, what do you reckon Peter would be doing now? Would he still be lugging his camera around uh, and, and uh, complaining about the, uh, no, the dynamic he, range of film? No, he most certainly wouldn't. I but, don't think so either. But he'd be an old codger like me and be right <laughs> on the threshold of understanding all this crap and it'd be getting him down. <laughs> uh, uh, he'd, probably, he'd, he'd probably depressingly for all of us have an HDR phase, I reckon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we, I we, we, we I don't, don't want that. <laughs> Chris, would you describe Peter's uh, kind of skill level as as cutting edge? Like, was he always kind of looking to progress and, and always researching what the best material and optics was out there? Or no, look, I don't think he was. I think he he just worked with what he had and and, uh, and made the most of it. And I remember when I got a sixty five mil lens, and I said, "Gee, you should have one of these, Pete." And and it was just first of all, it's one more bit of junk you've got to carry around, but he, he just said something like, oh, I, I know what I, I think the 90 mil was the widest he had, which is not, not a particularly wide angle lens, but um, it's a workhorse and, and, and he used it as such. And uh, um, yeah. But do you know what he typically travelled with, Chris, yeah, in terms uh, of the number of lenses? Uh, range? Uh, a, a 150, a 90. Uh, and a 300. I think that was his full compliment, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's quoted in the books as being all he had, really. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a couple of uh, light meters. Yeah. I mean, you can accomplish a lot with that. There's no question about it. And, and there will always be a time when you want a wider, a wider angle lens or a more telephoto, and that's just one of the things that haunt you as you go along, isn't it? Yeah. I think I'll calculate it out. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that in 35 millimeter terms, that's 24 mil 
around 50 mil and around 90 mil. Is that about right? That's about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rough, yeah. Rough. so it's about the same as a lot, what a lot of the tilt shift lenses actually are at the moment, which I found quite ironic too. Mm -hmm. um, Super tight on the top of frame, isn't it? He was probably the first person really to make the Tarkine a known area as well, photographical, would you say? I was asking about that. Like, do we know what yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that on your radar, Chris, the, the Tarkine, the Tarkina? Uh Not not originally, no. Um, although I went there before Peter, actually, and uh, uh, with Jenny in for, for a long trip and... Uh, Thought it was nice, but uh, it was only later that I went back and I started seeing seeing it for what it was, and uh, you know, a remarkable place, and there's so much potential there. It's incredible. Well, you, you spent more time there than most of us, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like. I've got to try to do another trip sometime soon. Actually, I wouldn't mind heading up there again. I, guess I, I, re I remember helping rescue Rob from one of his last trips. He was. <laughs> He was stuck on the side of the bank waving a big orange flag to get picked up by the ferry. And the guy was like, nah, mate, I'm not going to pick that guy up. And I really? pushed him for about 20 minutes. So you can't leave him there. <laughs> I wasn't sure it was Rob, but sure enough, I pushed him and we got to pick him up. And, uh, I, I remember coming across Chris, Chris with his supersized wing packs on the side of his thing. And I don't know how many weeks you've just been out there for. And I'd, I don't know how you carry that thing around, Chris, but I was just like, these guys are total legends. <laughs> As we're going through Peter's shots, uh, if I had to say one sort of directive, although of course it wasn't a directive from Peter, is that he regarded, and I quote, composition is king. Um, and I think that's, as Simon said, com good composition doesn't, doesn't go out of style. And mm. that's, you know, the light is not flashy. The subject is all types of things. Mm. But it's the composition where Peter excels and, yeah. 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 Must have been a game of millimetres for him as well in terms of lining some of these things up. Um, I can imagine that's where a lot of the time would have been taken and just very small micro movements just to mm. get everything just right. Mm. So is that one just up, just the, on the hills of Hobart? Is that like Ridgeway sort of area? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, Chimney Point. Yeah. 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 It's actually a lovely place to wander around, uh, Paul. It's worth worthwhile going for a walk. Well, it's just, I was just going to say to the audience, it's five minutes from my Grant and Chris and Rob's house, pretty much. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. oh, I love that shot. I've always found that quite an astounding image. I, I think going back to that question about why he, he chose the modality that he did, because it's a very cumbersome difficult kind of tool that's, to use but that's the one i'm in uh, yeah the, the, the level of control of, of perspective and particularly depth of field is phenomenal mm. if you know what you're doing and like that snow image just spoke to me in, in volumes of, of those two aspects mm. um, even today that is a very difficult composition to to create technically from front to back even with the most modern systems so you what it would have been like stacking or something like that would have been the far limit of his dynamic range there too. Yeah, exactly. That was the other aspect that really struck me. Yeah, that was the one I was talking about with the, the curly seaweed, um, which I particularly love. It's just, it's almost, I mean, it's obviously not placed, but it's just, it, it's almost too perfect the, the way it's been curled like that. It's just been recent. Yeah, I've just had a request from... Um, Somebody's contacted us to to get a couple of new seaweed images actually, and they're and they're both close ups. Um, yeah. Sort of bull kelp. There's a sort of greeny blue, beautiful uh, spiral bull you know, bull kelp. Oh, so yeah. that's that's on the way as well. That'll that'll get done in the next few weeks. Oh, um, fantastic. Mm. Um, I'm not sure what else we've got. Yes, yeah, so I can see we've done quite a few. Um, yeah. When you think about. How many hours goes into each one? They're not all 10 hours, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. What sort of um, megapixel or resolution are you sort of working with initially, Simon? Uh, the files, they're about 450 meg 16-bit um, TIFF files. Mm. Um, so they're, they came in as 2,000 
DPI um, uh, at 100%, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, and the original image area is, um, you know, um, 12, 12 and a half by um, 10 centimetres, roughly, yeah. film area. Yep. That's a fair bit to work with. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, striking. I think that's it. Ones Beautiful. Um, just to clarify, Simon, that there's only three current places that yeah, it's just going to for sale, and yours is one of them, and, and Wild Island is. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly pull up the other pull up the sites actually. So there's us. So we'll see here, this is our main web page, but there's a full gamut gallery uh, site there. And there's a few people, Rob's on here, um, Paul's on here as well. Um, um, and, uh, and Grant and, uh, and Grant Rick and as well. Me, and me. <laughs> um, yeah, so these, these images that we've seen tonight are, are all listed here. Um, you'll also find them on Rob's Wild Island. Uh, Um, so if you go shop online and art and photography. That's my um, favourite Rob shop there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> River, beautiful. Rapid River. Never, never seen mm. enough. Favourite place, Nick. Yeah. There you go. So there's a the collection there. So there's other photographers on there as well. Um, but just they, they, they all come through us. So all the images that you see here um, <laughs> are from our, our remastered collection. Um, and the only other place that's sort of selling them is the Wilderness Gallery up at Cradle Mountain. Um, and that's... They have a permanent collection? They've got a permanent set, yeah. So we, we've we redone all theirs. They actually had different prints from when the gallery was set up in... When was that set up? Mid, uh, in 2000, 2003, something like something that. Something like that, yeah. So they had the original prints there and they're all falling out of their frames and, and looking a bit tired. So I've actually redone their whole set. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a set too. Um, if you want to, um, if you want to see Peter's prints very large that you're seeing here, particularly Rock Island Bend and the, the Myrtle Tree and, and some of these, and then Wild Island Gallery in Salamanca Place in Hobart is a place to go because uh, you can see Simon's beautiful remastering work in very large prints on the walls. There, it's um, you'll be mesmerised. It's just fantastic. And I'm, I'm sort of interested too. Um, is there any um, uh, available kind of, I guess, on the um, market, uh, some of the original prints um, that, that would, have, would have been done, um, you know, back back in the day? Um, is that something that's, that, 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 was there many of his prints produced during that time? He, he, he did have some pseudochromes, uh, one of which I'd have got on the wall, but... Um... Superchromes just just don't cut it today. The, compared to inkjet prints, they're just not in the race, really. I think that I don't. Well, I mean, for people after original, maybe there are some people that feel that gee, that's an original. I, I might have an original rather than an inkjet, but gee, there's no there's no comparison, is there? Yeah. You know, uh, look, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, um, there's there's definitely um, sort of glossy RA four prints around. So so you know off the um, the chemical photographic prints. Um, and I think that's what Petty used to do, his prints. I, I know when we started doing them, you know, we had a bit of a conversation with Liz. Um, I'm not a big fan of gloss and we sort of talked around that a little bit and um, and uh, I got my way. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so, so there were a lot of, you know, uh, glossy, glossy prints made. Um, but I think those ones are... are, are cleaner i'm not a big fan of gloss i don't like a second reflection mm. you know if i've got something behind glass i don't like having glass and glossy print as well yeah. another thing to look out for i've seen is um people framing cards and and posters and mm. sort of passing them off as as prints as such mm -hmm. um so one, that's probably something to look out for yeah, i think one, there's one a lot of posters is, mass produced yeah yeah one thing we come across is you know people say oh I, you know i want to get a reprint i've had this on my wall and it's all faded i want to get a reprint let <clears throat> me say, no worries, that'll be, uh, you know, $600. And they go, oh, I only paid $25 for it. You know, so there's a misunderstanding between, you know, what was a poster. And trouble is the posters, they were, they were really well produced. Weren't they? Mm -hmm. they were, you know, probably, probably for the print quality at the time, they were 
good, but they were offset products mm. and they were always going to fade. Mm-hmm. Didn't you find one recently, Luke, online that you want to talk about? I think, yeah, yeah. someone was trying to sell a frame poster for $1,000. So, um, it had a signature, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, it had a signature, which was part of the poster, but um, <laughs> yeah, it was signed. So, oh, um, <laughs> yeah, so people are trying anything or or, or they were they actually had no idea um, what was going on. So I don't know which way around it was, but um, I've, I've seen quite a lot of it, actually, especially the framed um, cards um, going around and, that's quite interesting. Yeah, there's, there's not much of that original printed material left. Um, Rob brought up a bunch of old cards that, that I think Liz had and um, a few other bits and pieces, I think. But yeah, just about all that original West Wind Publishing Press stuff is all gone. Yeah. Good boy. The Wilton Society had a whole bunch of posters of, you know, probably eight or ten different types. And we've acquired that for Wild Island and somebody came in the other day and bought, sort of saw them and bought 50 of them. Just, oh, really? Uh, it just <laughs> doesn't happen every day. But, <laughs> yeah, it's, but it's a definitely limited stock. And it's honestly... Oh. Really You've still got some, Rob? We do. Right. Um, well, I'll yeah. put that off tomorrow. <laughs> I've, got a, I've, I've got, got a heaps of them already. Over the so I've, I've already stocked up from there. So, yeah, it's okay. a good selection. Don't, don't you take them from under me. <laughs> I told you about that ages ago, Nick. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just talking, I mean, obviously, oh, we've gone way over time, haven't we? Um, <clears throat> probably need to wrap right, things right. up, don't we? Yeah, I'd be keen to see if um, anyone, um, I, we may have already touched on it, but if anyone does, ha- um, what, what people's, um, if people do have like an overarching favourite image um, of, of Peter's just to, to wrap things up, or I, I know that's probably hard to make a, well, a decision. Maybe one, but, they, maybe one they feel most influenced by. For yeah, some, yeah. Or they feel drawn to just speak to or comment on. I, I actually grew up with this one on my wall and, and we spent every September holiday as a kid at Cradle Mountain. Mm. And you know, it's still the place that I go a couple of times a year. Um, so even though this isn't probably one of his iconic ones, it, it's 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 the it's one of the ones that really means the most to me. And in fact, there's another one from over on the other side of the plateau, looking looking back, um, which doesn't get a lot of airplay either. But it's, mm. it's one of my other favourite ones. Yeah, mm-hmm. but that, that's to do with place, I think. Yeah, it's got a little um, bowl tour. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, that was on the cover of one of his. One of the diaries, or one of the covers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's. But I, you know, I, mm. I think you probably find people relate to. Well, I relate to this because of the place. You know, I've got mm. a connection with the place, and you mm. probably find other people have a similar, yeah, mm. reflection. It'd be on. hard to repeat those conditions too. I would have thought. Mm. So. I, I got snowed in up there uh, <laughs> last year. I reckon it was exactly like that. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Cool, cool up my favorite. Oh yeah. yeah, sorry, Chris has got yeah. one he wants to share. Yeah. Hang on a sec. Uh, where did I have it? Um, I think it's right on the end. Yeah. When Peter died, uh, Liz knew I loved it, so she gave it to me. But I, I actually think it's the best image that Peter's ever done. And uh, while people might disagree with me, I remember when he took it and uh, he, he'd always call me back, call me up when he'd done a trip or, or I, I would too. And uh, he, he said, oh, this is what I got this morning. And I said, oh, it's fantastic. And I raved about it. It still is a breathtaking image and uh he said i'm it's going to go on the wellington book and i'm going to make it a double page spread and i said don't you dare <laughs> and it's the only time you ever listen to me i think <laughs> liz he died before the book was produced of course but uh liz decided to uh uh make it uh, just on one page but uh the colors aren't as <clears throat> wonderful as they are here but it's a, an astonishing image i think Chris, do you want to describe the qualities as to, to why you feel that way about it? Well, I suppose that it's not just sort of suggestive, it's just this extraordinary range of, of uh, 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 greys and whites. And it's just, um, mm. you know, you don't have to have gaudy colours in a, a picture for it to work. And, and this is just one that's just, a, a, I just find it ex- an exquisite image, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I no one yeah. agrees with me, but that's okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not so familiar with it, but it's it's a very sensual and suggestive, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a erotic sort of image, really. Mm. Mm. Um, and it, yeah, it just has connotations of culture, and there's there's lots of different ways to read into this, mm. and the symbology on it is is, is quite incredible. Mm. I think I'd heard Liz once say that you know. That 
jokingly that there were Peter had a bit of a um a bent for the suggestive image and she said and you'd say, Oh yeah, that one's a picture of me and you know, she'd say this, you know, Peter took this one, this one's me, and that one's Peter. I'm going, I really don't need to know this, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 funny, it's funny um um that um I've personally taken on taking photos that are a bit suggestive, knowing that as a bit of a joke. So anytime I take a picture of something a bit phallic or a bit uh, a bit of homage, a bit, homage maybe a bit female, it's it's a it's it's a it's an in joke that I have with myself. Um, Best not shared, I'd say. From, sorry. Best not shared, probably. <laughs> but relate <laughs> it does it does, look. It's a conscious thing, and it does relate back to that particular commentary in that documentary. Um, yeah, right. yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you take images anyway, but I, I just tend to, if I see one that, that might be slightly suggestive, I'll definitely take it and I'll probably put it up and, and have a bit of a giggle to myself when I do it. But, um, you yeah. can't help yourself, Nick. No, I can't. I can't. I just do it all the time now. It's just become a bit of a running thing with me. Um, yeah. I think what stands out to me about this image is the, the tonal range is unbelievable. Yeah. 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 The range oh, of... Yeah. I'll just say I haven't I haven't probably finished this one. I just just did a quick job on this so Chris could show it. Um, but it's not one of the ones we've actually worked on yet. Grant, do you have a, any particular images that have really spoken to you over the years? Uh, no, not a specific one. I mean, as I said earlier, the the images of Peter's that most appeal to me are his details, but not a particular detail. I mean, and and going through, in fact, the calendars and diaries and books to pull out that half dozen that I showed earlier, um, mm. reminded me how many there were you know, that I'd forgotten mm. about and the like. Um, <clears throat> in fact, um, on, uh, when when Paul asked me to be part of this tonight and potentially talk about uh, you know, the influence of Peter, it sort of got me reflecting a bit on, you know, well, what's, what's the nature of influence, which is obviously a very personal thing, and Rob talked a bit about it earlier for him. Um, for me, it's, I mean, I... I it's just something in the background. I mean, I, I grew up with Peter's images um, on the wall, like Simon describes, you know, calendars and the like. Although being a bit older, I was already out there knowing these spaces before I actually started looking at the calendars. So in a sense, they were just like um, uh, reminders of places I'd been to rather than inspiration of places that I might want to go to. Uh, and, uh, and it's just sort of been in the background. So I imagine, yes, it has probably influenced my photography over the years, but I couldn't nail exactly how. It's just part of the, the gamut of um, images of, that you see that you like, basically. But yes, yeah, so to answer the question succinctly, um, I like his details. This one's being a, a fine example, but also the ones I showed earlier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah listen, thanks for taking the time to bring up some of those earlier ones for us, Grant. Like, mm. not many I've got access to those sort of images. Mm. Rob, do you have a, any sort of flavour or, or sense or, or highlight in terms of his work, in terms of the, either the qualities or any specific images that really influenced you? No, I like so many, I like, you know, so many elements within them, but I sort of wanted to hijack <laughs> this last portion or attempt to hijack the last portion just to bring it back to this question of photography and conservation and the relationship between the two. Yeah, please. If Peter were alive today, like I think the world when he was when he you know burst onto the scene with these gorgeous images was a very different place to what it is now, and if he were alive today, would he be up, you know, wandering through the rainforest of the Tarkine and the images that he took, you know, he would at some point I'm sure, would the images that he took have the same impact with us now, even if they were of the same caliber, even better than the ones he took when he was when he really was alive, or, you know. Can images move social sentiment and political outcomes as much now as they did then? And I, I think not, obviously. No. Um, but it's sort of interesting to reflect on that, how profound you know, almost every individual images of Peter's, you know, what, what a ripple effect it had. And there, is, there are wonderful photographers around now and amazing people doing other stuff with, with visuals, with video, really high-class stuff. And it's not cutting through. Yeah. I guess there's a saturation with social media now with so many images and 
um, to to stand out and to actually have a, a platform or, or a, a space where people can actually access your work when there's so many other people vying for attention, some um, sort of gets drowned out in the crowd. Um, whereas um, back when Peter was shooting and, and putting out his work like that, um, you know, the, there was the pool was a lot smaller. You should you, you could say so that would certainly have a big impact as well. Mm. But also, is I mean, the question is society as receptive to seeing beauty now as it was then? And I think not. I think you know we are in a, a harder, meaner, more self-centered era. Tragically, maybe that's true, Robin. But also, it possibly it's uh, another reason to uh, for people to strive harder to do more imaginative stuff because there's no point any of us uh, reproducing you know, mount such and such from late such and such if, it, if people have seen it all before. I think stuff has to be more exciting and more original. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I mean, you'd like to think that, you know, the best will always float to the top, etc. cetera, but um, I'm inclined to agree with a lot of what Rob says, which is unusual in some respects. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I think uh, I think there's something more fundamental happened, and that's... Uh, the, a, a, a decline in the appreciation of photography generally um, and you know I don't know there's a whole lot of elements to that which have been touched upon before you know the validity of the, as a represent a true representation of something and um, the just the fact that there's so much images out there so you get blase I guess um, certainly a lack of appreciation of what makes a quality image or a quality publication in my direct experience mm. so uh, and yeah, maybe all that's really just an overlay on a, a change in all the more basic elements of society that Rob's talking about. None of it uh, is a particularly positive view of the world, though. Mm. The outcome, though, and I totally agree with you, Chris, the outcome of that is, yes, we've simply got bigger challenges now. Like Peter had immense challenges in his day, and we've got totally different challenges. But, you know, we, we, that's that's our struggle that's our challenge to find new creative ways to try and cut through in whatever way it can be mm. yeah do we do we give up do we say what's the point of wilderness photography what's the point of conservation photography if it's not not viewed not appreciated and i i obviously don't agree with that um but <laughs> it is a fairly um negative space that we are working in 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 terms of image appreciation um, and yeah, you're right. We do have to think of more innovative ways and we do have to step away from the popular views that have seen before and, and just remind people what's there by being a bit more introspective about it, I think, and just focusing a little more on, on, um, you know, the, the, the details of the landscape and, uh, and that sort of thing, uh, I guess, is helpful. But I mean, it's not exactly reimagining things, I suppose. But um... Rob, Rob, you just sort of come back today from you know the front line of of an element of conservation. What, what's the kind of mindset that you're, you know, going into, uh, you know, in, in modern times? You know, how are you sort of answering your own question? I guess that was what I'm asking you. There. So it was touched on before, and Chris was saying, you know, you don't go, you know, you, you know, one is a naturalist, and I think we all are first and foremost and if you go to a place saying i'm going to get the image which is going to be used in the you know the next pamphlet of the bob brown foundation you're going to fail you know you won't come up with any anything interesting because you will have preconceived an outcome and that's always pretty boring so you have to go into a space openly and just trying to engage and find yourself there and you know poke around and see what you can find um when I was referring to, you know, really good work, you know, there's some people working with BBF, working under incredible conditions at incredible speed. And I'm thinking more of video, I guess, here than stills, mm. but producing really high quality stuff that they're churning out like a high quality video every couple of days. Mm. Um, but again, it's not, and you know, the, I'm talking about the BBF, it's got a good reach. It's got a, a lot of people on its mailing and circulation list but it's not going mainstream and it, it has been studiously ignored by the mainstream media, ABC, Mercury, commercial stations. Mm. Uh, there hasn't been a mention of the fact that, you know, people have been arrested protesting this um, new proposed tailings dam in the Tarkine, which is going to, you know, absolutely trash, you know, 200, 
250 hectares of rainforest. And I walked through that rainforest a couple of days ago. It's gorgeous. It's mm. as fine as anything in Lake Sinclair. You know, Lake Sinclair, this is this lovely caladendrous rainforest. It hasn't rated a peep on the media because there's obviously a, a clear message from the media bosses, including the ABC, not to run anything the BBF is doing. Mm. So where do we go from here? And this, this is our challenge. You know, I'm not depressed by it. You know, it's depressing the prospect, but it's a galvanising situation. How do we... How do we break through? And, you know, it's part of trying to, again, point, you know, help the planet and everything that lives on the planet veer from its trajectory, which is a disastrous trajectory. Mm. It's not depressing. You know, it's a, it's a challenge of our time. Well, it's not depressing. It's just current. It's just kind yeah. of how it is. And we need to embrace that reality and however we, you know, choose to see fit. And I think we all feel, recognise that we, we have the capacity and in a way as a gift, uh, you know, with, with image making and, and with that becomes a, an invitation at the very least, if not a responsibility to use that to, you know, better the world somehow and however we, we choose to do so. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's what touched me with Peter's work and arriving here, you know, 22 years ago, not knowing a place from a bar of soap, I've never even heard of the place. And, and I, I discovered it through Peter's work and, and you know, within, within a few weeks, I, I spent three months out in the bush sort of following the lines of, of, of some of the places that he'd, he'd laid out an invitation for in a way, not necessarily specific places, but just that, that openness to possibility uh, of exploration and understanding of landscape that I'd never really so profoundly seen laid, laid bare, I guess, in front of me in, in such an exquisite form. And, and I guess, you know, that, that's, that's the legacy of Peter that's gonna, that has stood the test of time more than, more than most in the world, probably in his era. And you never know who's going to see the p- pictures you put out there. So it's, um, uh, some people think it needs to be a certain number or you need to have a certain reach, but all you need to do is reach the right person and reach the, you know, touch someone that you know, if, it, if it affects just one person, it's worth doing because you don't know what the flow and effect of that is. Um, just like, um, you know, Peter's work um, affecting Rob in that sort of way and, and, and now Rob being able to, you know, do some amazing work um, with the conservation message that he has. So, you know, it's, um, it's all, it's all part of that. So um, yeah, certainly never a, a case for giving up in that res- respect. And it, it just comes back to our individual just joy and, and passion for connecting with landscape. And, and as Chris alluded to, it, it's, it's actually a tool to deepen that connection and, and strengthen it and, and, you know, get you to search in areas and see things in ways you, you, you wouldn't have, taking the time to do so otherwise um, and that's that's I think once you once you've overcome the technical aspects of of what you want to create it all, all becomes about that relationship and the creativity around it yeah I think you know to me Peter's legacy is simply um, that he opened up my eyes um, mm. he showed me what was here and I haven't looked back since, and I'm sure there are a lot of people nodding their heads at home at the moment. Um, it's you know it's a simple one out of many many legacies, um, but um, yeah, he just opened my eyes to what was there. I lived here, I was born here. I could have just left like everyone else leaves, but no, um, he showed me what was here and what we had, and how beautiful it was. And um, I guess that's his legacy to me. Uh, and on that note, we are probably going to have to finish up soon. Um, yeah. And um, I don't know if anyone wants a final, a final word on on Peter's legacy to them, or or or, or what it is, um, or do we finish up? <laughs> it's got well, a couple well, of lines, gentlemen. I just got a couple of lines here from Wild Rivers that I can just read because again it comes back to like it's a really common theme of conservation he talks about you know growing up and then he talks about Bob Brown and Paul Smith rafting down the Franklin and he says and so in the summer of 79 and again in 80 and 81 I followed in Bob Brown's wake and made three full length trips by rubber raft down the Franklin the river was all that I had hoped and more it was grander wilder more remote and touched me more deeply than any other place i had ever known that i, I had known in tasmania's southwest 
you know, his motivation there is very clear. He wasn't doing it just because, I mean, he liked the place, but he was, you know, he was following in Bob Brown's wake. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful quote too. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, gentlemen, to, to have you with us tonight. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, we'll have to um, get some sleep at some point, so I'll um, leave it there. But, um, yeah, it's been a real um, privilege to have you with us and, and uh, talk about such a, um, a, an amazing photographer that's had um, a profound effect on us all in, 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 some, in, in different ways and in similar ways. So um, do you have anything final to add, Nick, before we sign out? Oh, no, I don't think so. I think we've, yeah. we've had a had a, a, a wonderful show, and um, yeah. and thank you to those that are still watching and, uh, and and allowing us to to bring Peter's legacy to you. Um, and um, yeah, this this show means a lot to us, um, being a fiftieth show, but it, it it comes back to the the you know one of the very roots of where we we all started, and that is. Um, Peter's legacy. So thank you very much. And I'm really um, thrilled to have had um, our guests on tonight, uh, and particularly Chris, because you haven't been with us before. But um, uh, certainly I'll be knocking on your door shortly to, um, to uh, have your own show with us and, um, and we can discuss your work. So thank you very much. That would be absolutely fantastic. And I'll also put a, um, a link to the Wildness um, uh, video on YouTube. Um, very highly recommended uh, viewing um, if you're interested in, in Peter's story and, and um, might be some familiar faces on there as well. Um, and yeah, um, so that's well worth um, following up. And also please um, look out for... Um, any of uh, Peter's books and calendars that, that might be around that you can have a look at because there's um, plenty of amazing photos that, um, you know, crop up and every now and then I even see one that I, I was like, oh, I've never seen that one before. So it's um, always lovely to, to appreciate the work. So um, could, I, could I make a request to finish the show on, on Peter's famous quote around why he went out there yeah. and what he went back to? Because I yeah. feel like that's what struck me and stayed with me my whole life since I first heard it. Does anyone have it? Have the actual words? Uh, I'll give it very quickly, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. just, uh, just, it just struck me how appropriate that would be to, to finish things on it and leave people to contemplate on. And um, Grant, Rob, Simon, Chris, absolute privilege. Thank you for taking the time to come out and, and be here for us and honour um, honor Peter in this way and and, uh, and honour us on, on the show here with your really valuable time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. 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 When you go out there, you don't get away from it all. You get back to it. You get back to it all. You come home to what's important. You come home to yourself. Yeah. And on that note, um, we thank you again, gentlemen, and and have a great night. And we'll see you next time, everybody. Have a great evening. All right. Night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.